Hey everybody, welcome to class. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And this is a free, live, online, open to everyone, home inspection training class. And we're gonna do a home inspection together. We're going to review a home inspection that I performed recently on a house, a two-story house. A uh, couple bedrooms, couple baths, a garage, and we're gonna take a look at the home inspection report that I wrote. And um, we'll start in just a couple minutes. We'll let everybody get online. Uh, we had almost 600 students register, um, so that's pretty exciting. That's a lot of students. So we'll let them get online and figure out the technology. But while we're here together, um, some logistics, you should be able to hear me. I can't hear you. Um, thanks, Justin. You should be able to see me. I can't see you. And if you wanted to ask a question, feel free. This is a free online and live class. So I'm here to answer your questions. Um, you may have a few since there are almost 600 registered for class. We'll try to get through them all. Um, I'm not sure if it's practical, but we'll try. Um, on your screen, you should see a question and answer button. Um, you can ask questions there. The cool thing about this feature is if you like the question that one of the other students uh, asked, you could bump it up. You can give it a thumbs up and that can take it up to the top of the, the list of questions. So feel free to ask questions. If you are um, watching this and you, uh, your phone rings, your business phone rings, and it's a new job, pick it up, uh, schedule it. Uh, or if you have something else important, like maybe a football game uh, tonight, feel free to um, go in and out of class tonight. We'll go about two hours maybe. Um, the class is being video recorded. All of our classes are recorded so that you can watch them later. And they're at natchiorg slash webinars. And I'll show you the URL later. So I hope everyone who wanted to come was able to come tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Justin, Eric, you're welcome. Ryan just got his license today. He's already a certified professional inspector, a CPI, that's a national uh, designation um, credential. Congrats, Ryan. John is here. <laughs> John, we see each other a lot. You do get credits for taking this live class. Um, and if um, we get audited, uh, I have um, the, uh, 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 the account of you logging in and staying online throughout the entire class. And with InterNACHI, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you're an InterNACHI member and you're taking um, a class like this, or um, you are attending a chapter meeting and it's an educational session, one-to-one um, -one means if you spend an hour at that event or training session or class um, that is provided outside of InterNACHI's online college, um, you can go in and add that credit into your education log and it'll be in your transcript. And so if we only go an hour tonight, John and everybody, uh, it's one hour, but we're planning on two hours. We'll see how it goes. Um, there's a few questions about licenses and certifications and New York. Um, Justin asks, I'll do one more question and then we'll get to, we'll get into the meat of the class. Currently residing in New York City, working for building inspection, it, uh, building inspections or building inspectors. It doesn't qualify me to complete local home inspections. And I was wondering, how should I get locally certified? I've been trying to find answers, um, but with COVID, it, may, it makes things harder. Yep. Um, so getting my certificate for code enforcement official. Um, that's different from a home inspector. And that's one of the points we'll probably make tonight, that a home inspection is not a code inspection. If you wanted to be a code inspector, 
um, most, if not all, that I know of, all municipalities require you to become ICC certified. And InterNACHI can help you become that. Like for example, last, oh, I think it was last month or two, uh, we had a live class like this and we went through the stack of IRC flashcards and we asked each other questions and went over the answers. So we have code training courses that are online and code resources. In fact, I think we have about uh, 80 um, ICC approved free online courses. Um, so if you need help um, with the difference between uh, national certification like InterNACHI can provide and a local license or local certification uh, for your area, feel free to ask your education team. So at InterNACHI, at that URL, nachi.org slash contact, you'll find um, everyone who works at InterNACHI and everyone works for you. So that's one of the great benefits of being a member of InterNACHI. You have about 30 full-time staff working to help you and your business. Feel free to take advantage of that membership benefit. So um, there's an education team on that contact page. There's a member services team. There's a marketing team. There's all these teams that work for you. So feel free to visit our contact page and contact anyone at InterNACHI and ask them for help. In fact, take advantage of that. Go to the marketing team. Jessica is a director of marketing and ask her, what can the marketing team at InterNACHI do for my business? What can the marketing team do for my business? That's a great question. I'm from InterNACHI, that's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We are the world's largest membership trade organization headquartered in Colorado. Um, we have people that work in InterNACHI all over the world. Um, and uh, we're the largest, uh, essentially we train and certify home inspectors and commercial property inspectors all over the world and it's all online and free. So go to natchi.org slash, um, well, just go to any natchi.org page and click around. The InterNACHI School is the only nationally accredited tuition-free home inspector college accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. We're also a member college of, a member career college of uh, Canada. Visit internachi.edu. One of the things is um, you are essentially a student of a college when you join InterNACHI and you start taking our courses. Our home inspector certificate program is the only nationally accredited home inspector certificate program provided by a college. So if you're thinking about becoming a home inspector, I would recommend looking at the qualifications, the credentials, the certifications of the school itself and shoot for the highest. So when you're a member of InterNACHI and you're taking the courses online and you're becoming a home inspector certified through InterNACHI, you're essentially a college student. So if you wanted to download your college ID card. Um, at, uh, education team, the education team at education at internachi.org can help you. Just email them education at internachi.org and ask about the college ID card. You have to be a certified home inspector to um, download that card. You have to be a certified home inspector to take advantage of the marketing services. You have to be a certified home inspector to uh, download a certificate that says I'm a certified home inspector. There's a few other things. So I encourage you, no matter where you are, New York State, which requires licensing, or an unregulated state, become an InterNACHI certified home inspector um, and take advantage of all the membership benefits. One of the unique things is the college ID thing. Uh, this is an InterNACHI webinar. So if you wanted to um, uh, take a class online that's free and follow along while certified professional inspectors perform home inspections and write inspection reports according to the standards of practice, um, it's available to you at natchiorg slash webinars. Free, online, live, open to everyone, members and non-members alike. We have a home inspector podcast as well. That's at natchiorg slash podcast and enjoy listening while you're driving, get smarter while you're driving to your inspection jobs, right? And that's at natchi.org slash podcast. Everything you need all in one place, all these URLs, right? And if you get lost, uh, internet you provide so much online, sometimes it could be confusing. Uh, remember where the contact page is. If you need help, just reach out to somebody.
But if everything you need, if you're looking for everything, we put it all on one page, natcha.org slash everything. And if you're looking for the only free online accredited tuition free home inspector college, internatchee.edu. We have more than 60 types of inspector certification programs, more than 60. So if you're thinking about becoming a home inspector, that's great, but you should think about ancillary services, ancillary inspections, vertical markets. If you're inspecting homes that have pools, for example, and you wanna learn how to inspect a pool thoroughly and competently, and you wanna be trained and certified, go to InterNACHI. We have a, a, a certification program so that you become a, a certified pool inspector, for example. And they're all online at natchiorg slash certification. And if we go there now, one of the certifications is, let's see if I can do something fancy. There we go. Infrared certified. So if you click that to become infrared certified, it will give you the two requirements to become infrared certified. One, you have to join InterNACHI as a member. Why? Well, when you join InterNACHI as a member, a whole world of opportunity opens up to you. Training, certification, education, continuing education, state credits, all that stuff. And then you have to fulfill the infrared certification requirements. Um, oh, the other, the other certification I like is, if you go to the certification page and scroll down, we have um, new constructor, uh, new, new construction inspector. So if you're inspecting new construction, newly built homes, brand new homes haven't been lived in yet, we have a, a logo for you. And when you become certified, you can use these logos to your advantage in your marketing. We also have woman owned business logo. Uh, so there are a few females in uh, the home inspection industry, but InterNACHI loves to celebrate them and help them out. And so we have a logo, maybe that could be an advantage to you. We can talk about that as well while we perform a home inspection on this house. So we're going to perform a home inspection and read the inspection report. Let's also talk about business resources, marketing strategies, getting started as a home inspector, boosting your existing business if you're a veteran and experienced inspector, and anything else you'd like. Just use the Q&A feature on your screen. And it's worth two InterNACHI CE credits, like we mentioned before and John asked. If you're not a member and you're interested in joining, but you don't want the cost, you want to just uh, take a stroll through <laughs> the InterNACHI amusement park, it's available to you. Email me, ben at internachi.org, and I'll give you a 14-day free trial membership. You'll have full access, just like a full member of all the courses. You can take any course you want, for example just like a full member has. No credit card required. Why join InterNACHI? Well, we have a ton of membership benefits and we have a related web page for that, listing all the membership benefits at natchiorg slash benefits. And again, if you don't wanna write down all these URLs and you're missing them, no problem. Just email someone, me, education team at education at internachi.org and ask for the URLs. Let's inspect this house, okay? Oh, I see Justin is getting some help by Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Steve, a little bit nervous? No problem. Um, I remember when I was nervous, I was nervous for about a year or two as a home inspector. Um, and the root of all mm, nervousness or being um, not confident enough or not being assured enough, the root of all that is uncertainty. That's all. If you, if you were certain of what you were qualified or able to do, you'd be a home inspector because it's so much fun. So to bridge that gap of uncertainty, not knowing what to do, not knowing how to do it, not knowing what to say as a home inspector, that's where InterNACHI comes into play. Take full advantage of the resources that InterNACHI has so that you and I can inspect this house. Okay, so let's do it. The first thing I think about when I perform a home inspection is a standard. It's called a standards of practice. And then we have one, InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice, is available at natchiorg slash SOP. If we go there, it's pretty straightforward. You have a couple sections here. Let me zoom in a little bit. 
And it starts with the roof and then the exterior and basement foundation crawl space structure, heating, cooling, plumbing. You need to inspect all these systems, fireplace, attic, insulation, doors, windows, interior. So if we go to the roof, you click that. The inspector shall inspect from ground level or the eaves, the roof covering materials, the gutters, downspouts, and it tells you what you are required to inspect, describe, report, and not required to do. There are exclusions and disclaimers and limitations. You're essentially performing a visual home inspection, a visual only home inspection, which means like you can think of your two hands as tied behind your back. And you're just looking around with your two eyes and I'm observing and making a report based upon your observations. So the standards of practice, if you go to natchee.org slash SOP, there's a roof section. And one of the main points is that you're not required to walk upon any roof surface, even if that roof surface is flat and only 10 feet above the ground, like a one story uh, pizza shop that has a flat roof, a little, a little commercial building, or maybe it's a, a carport and the, the roof is very slow. It's a slow, low, low sloped roof. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. You're not required to use a ladder According to the national standards, the international standards of practice, there may be a, a local standards of practice like we talked about earlier. Um, someone had a question about New York or uh, another state. They may have their own standards of practice. If you don't know, ask Internet. It will lead you in the right direction. For example, Florida, if you're from Florida right now, um, good folks in Florida are, are bailing themselves out of all that water um, from the hurricane. They have their own home inspection standards of practice. It's almost identical to Internet G's national standards of practice, international standards of practice, almost. There's a slight difference. Which one, if you're a home inspector, which one do you comply with? Which one do you abide by? Which one do you follow? Which one are you required to follow? Local. Local overrules anything national. And that, and that um, is also related to code. So if, if you're thinking about code, national code, there's an international residential code that we refer to a lot. Local code, local authority having jurisdiction, the local building inspector overrules everything. It's kind of fun to be the local building inspector. You get to interpret and make your own rules, regardless of the national rules. So you're not required to walk upon any roof surface, but that picture is in my inspection report for sure, because that picture sells my brand. My brand is I get up on any roof that I possibly can because I'm carrying big ladders. I got a big van, a big Ford van with a ladder rack and I carry a 40 foot 4D, 40, F-O-R-T-Y, 40 foot aluminum ladder. Those are for the barns and the commercial buildings. 28 foot fiberglass, um, 32 foot, 28 foot fiberglass to those, uh, 12 foot aluminum, uh, step ladder and crawl space gear. I go from all the way down in the ground to all the way up in the sky. You're not required to. That's going well beyond the standards of practice. Now, how would you beat me in the market if I, if this was part of my brand? You have to think of ways, if you're a home inspector and you and I are friendly competitors, how are you going to beat me in that market? Because this is valuable. This is of value, of great overwhelming value to my clients who want to know what is the condition of the roof from up close? Are you gonna get up there, you know? Well, if you don't, you're gonna to have to figure out, are you gonna do a drone? Maybe you can do a ladder from the gutter edge. Maybe you have binoculars. Maybe you have a subcontractor come. You hire the roofer to come. Maybe you have a friend who does it. Maybe you, sub you have to figure out a way to beat me in the market because this, these are the pictures that I take and everyone knows that I perform a home inspection and I go up on the roof. In fact, I get there early so I can go up on the roof. I can do two jobs a day alone, three if I have a partner. Eight o'clock, 12 o'clock, eight o'clock, you get there at 7.30, 7.45, I go up on the roof and by the time my clients come, I come down the ladder, I shake their hand, good first impression, and I'm actually done with the roof inspection and I'm taking pictures along the way. I take pictures of every field, 
every intersection, every valley, everything that penetrates or touches the roof covering materials. And by the way, I'm inspecting the roof covering materials. I'm not inspecting the roof system. I'm not inspecting the roof assembly. I'm not inspecting the fasteners, for example. Roof covering is a surface that I observed in a visual only inspection. Remember, two hands behind my back. If I'm inspecting and commenting upon the roof system, terminology is really important. It can, it can, um, it can be a, a tool for your success and it can get you into trouble. So think about using roof covering materials when you're uh, communicating what you observed. You don't wanna say you inspected the roof system or the roof assembly, because that includes, and we'll take a look at the code, that includes um, the fasteners, the underlayment. So tell me, tell me about the fasteners in this picture. Are they staples or are they nails? Is there underlayment? What kind of cut is that valley? How far up does it go? You can take a look at that if you wanted to, but it's really a visual only inspection. You're not commenting upon the things that you cannot see. You're not required. Oh, I put that in my inspection report as well. And on my website, I want everybody to know this is me. This is big Ben inspections. Why would you hire a home inspector who doesn't provide this kind of value? See, I'm kind of mean in my marketing. Why would you hire a home inspector that doesn't get up on the roof? How are you gonna beat that? Or do you need to? Maybe you don't need to. Maybe, ah, uh, you know, you're risking your life. You don't need to do that. That's just crazy. You don't have to get up on the roof. True, but if you and I are in the same market, oh, I like that picture. I use that. I've actually used that in a small claims court. I was sued and I wanted to show the judge to actually get up and touch everything. It doesn't have to be the roof. Let's move on to a, another system. Let's say it's um, uh, that chair behind me with my tool bag, right? So I put my hand on the, on the thing that I'm inspecting, why? Because a lot of your clients are first time home buyers and they have no idea what they're looking at. Imagine looking at um, this and not knowing anything about roofs. You and I know what that is, right? Three tab asphalt shingle on a roof at an angle, low slope roof. But um, if you do this, then it kind of puts context in all of your pictures. So I'm performing a home inspection, I'm taking a look at the roof, and I'm taking about 30 some pictures that help, well, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So I'm taking a lot of pictures and I'm explaining a lot with those pictures. Like that's a roof penetration. I'm not gonna get up too close because I don't wanna fall off the roof. That's a roof valley. There's a satellite dish. I hate those fasteners that go through. They goop some silicone on there. It's just there. So I'm gonna try to remember if I can get to that area while I'm inspecting the roof, the underside of the roof structure, I'm gonna see if I can get to that area, see if it's leaking. So I take pictures of everything that I possibly can. Every, I walk along the ridge, very careful, and uh, take pictures of every field. And also do video too. I don't know if this is actually. The asphalt shingle roof appears to be in good shape, functional, original to the house. I don't see any missing shingles, nothing cracked or damaged. I don't see any repairs that have been performed. The shingles are lying flat. The granular surface looks good. So it's a young roof with plenty of life left on it. There's a ridge vent providing ventilation for the attic space. This is the vent stack pipe for the gas-fired appliances in the basement. Satellite on the roof. There's flashing around the sewer vent pipes that come up through the roof. That's good. And it goes on. I then take that video and I um, play it for my clients because I don't allow my clients to get up on the roof, but I want them to experience what I did on the roof so that they know their roof was inspected thoroughly. And I keep that video and I share that video. And I play that video and they're just shocked. And they know that they've hired the right inspector. So use video. Nowadays, like 
the software that I use and the software that I test and try out, um, a lot of them, the good ones, allow you to incorporate video into your report. They're cloud-based. When you convert it into a PDF, that video obviously doesn't play on a PDF. Or when you print it out, it obviously doesn't work that way. But we're moving towards, the whole industry is moving towards cloud-based reporting. So you can put videos in really high def 4K stuff, illustrations, tons of pictures. So think about doing video and then sharing that video, maybe just on your mobile device, right? Because software that I enjoy using, you can use it on your mobile device. So like an iPad, a, a tablet, an iPhone, Android, other things like that, right? A pixel, and then play that video for your client. It's a really great value you can provide to your client. To exceed or not to exceed, that's the question. Um, and if we go there, we wrote an article, our legal counsel, uh, and Nick, my brother, founder of Internachi, helped write this um, short article about exceeding or not exceeding. And basically, it's this paragraph. When in doubt about what the SOP, standards of practice, requires in a particular situation, the inspector should err on the side of caution and exceed what the SOP requires. It's better to do a little more than what may be required than to do less and risk a potential claim and harm your reputation. There are some cautionary um, words here though. So read the entire article and that's at that URL. So it looks pretty good. There's um, roof penetrations, there's flashing around the vent pipes, drain waste vent pipes. There's pipes that I can't reach, but I'm gonna take a picture of them. There's a chimney stack. It's coming from a uh, fuel fired appliance. I'm gonna guess a gas fired heating system when I'm the, maybe the hot water tank, not sure. The gutters look good. Now I'm thinking about coming down the ladder and the gutters look clean, that's good. And as I'm coming down, I'm taking pictures of other components of the house. At the eaves, there's the fascia and there's soffit vents and it intersects with the siding and that's vinyl siding. I can see, oh, that all looks great. There's a shot of where my ladder is uh, located right at the front door. I do that on purpose. Well, there's a valley right there. So I love putting my ladder up against the valley and tying it off and then going up and tying off if I can, but um, myself, but uh, I put it up at the front so that, well, when I get there early, I maybe knock on the door, see if I can get it, um, see if I can get access to the roof, tell the occupant or homeowner that I'm here. Maybe they're not there. That'd be really great. And I just go, I don't want to bother them anyway. I'll need to go in. And then uh, I put my ladder up there. And then I imagine my client pulling up to the driveway and seeing the ladder and seeing me up on the roof waving to them. And I just imagine that all of my clients were like, felt assured that they made the right decision in hiring the right inspector. Maybe took the agent's recommendation to refer, who referred their client to me. So I, it was part of my brand. There's a little bit of a show that I do as well. I actually I believe that I was a better inspector when I exceeded the standards of practice, but it was part of my marketing strategy as well. If there was anything that I did that made me a better inspector, I didn't keep it a secret. I, it was part of my mar marketing strategy. For example, um, I brought my tool bag. You know, this is my FLIR C2, right? They don't make them anymore. And now they're FLIR C5s. I'm gonna get one. Maybe when I drop this one. Um, so this is my infrared camera. Now, infrared, you don't need a fancy infrared camera. You can be infrared certified. Uh, through internet and you don't even need an infrared camera right um, but get one a FLIR c2 the most affordable one is FLIR c2 FLIR c5 i love the FLIRs, um, and i would say to get your foot in the door you know this is what you used you know you can use this this is very affordable several hundred dollars and it provides you with a marketing strategy this is value that you provide to your clients. And when you add value to your service, you can demand a higher price. Why would you hire a home inspector who doesn't use infrared today? 
or a moisture meter and a moisture meter. You need a moisture meter with this. It's like a companion tool. You need both infrared. If you're gonna to touch an infrared camera, you better have a moisture meter on hand. And we have an infrared training class and I've done videos on infrared, how to use infrared. But the point is that if I'm going to use a specialized tool or exceed the standards of practice, infrared, the word infrared isn't in the standards of practice, nor is a ladder, nor is a flashlight. I mean, you could, you could argue that if you're using a flashlight, you're exceeding the standards of practice. The word flashlight does not appear in the standards of practice. So if you're using a flashlight, one could argue you're already exceeding the standards of practice. So if I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna put this in my marketing. I'm gonna let everybody know that I'm a home inspector who uses infrared on every inspection because infrared allows me to see things that other home inspectors can't see with their eyes. So why would you hire a home inspector who can just see what you see? I can see more. I see things that other home inspectors can't just for several hundred dollars. I, I'd pay several hundred dollars in order to say that in my marketing and in my brand. Where were we? Oh, I see some of your questions and uh, some of them are being bumped up and I'm, I'm down to Greg's. Greg says, I really appreciate, appreciate the internet G House of Horrors. I attended the first House of Horrors in Florida. Um, at this point, can you recommend electrical webinars? It's the area that I find the trickiest. I, I, I've, hear, I've heard that many times. Electrical is re really difficult. We're gonna go through some of the electrical things and where to find resources on electrical. If you go to um, InterNACHI's education page um, and type in electrical, we have a ton of resources. If you go to InterNACHI's YouTube page or my YouTube page and type electrical, or go to InterNACHI's webinar page and type electrical, there's a lot of electrical. We have articles on electrical. We have articles on um, grounding and bonding. We have articles on um, CSST, right? If you don't know what that is, that's okay. Um, learn about it. We have a ton of articles. We have, a, we have a, um, a video called the electrical wall of defects. We built a wall with a ton of commonly found electrical defects and uncommonly found. So we have plenty of resources for you. Um, don't go and, uh, well, you know, you can, you can go to another school if you like. I mean, there are many very good schools out there. Um, I don't know of any, oh, there we go. So how do you inspect the electrical system? Um, you go to natchiorg slash education and type in electrical. How do you inspect the roof? Well, you go to natchiorg page, let's do it, and type in roof in the field, in the search field. So here's our, education page and you type in into the field here, electrical, let's say. So we have the advanced electrical inspection training course. That was a really good one. Inspecting commercial electrical systems. That's very good. How to perform residential electrical inspections. Um, how to perform uh, electrical inspections in relation to being a healthy homes inspector. So we have that. Um, so it just keeps going on and on. And we also have roof roof data technician course, general roof inspection training video, advanced residential roof inspection course. If you're from South Africa, we have that. Um, someone asked in the stream of questions here about different types of roofs like tile or slate. Uh, we have that. So here's inspecting tile roofs right here, all kinds of tiles right there. And it's a video course. So it's a really good visual course. According to home inspection standards of practice, the inspectors shall inspect from the ground level or the eaves, not from the roof surface, the roof covering materials, right? And that's already inspected. We already inspected that. That's three tab asphalt shingle, you can call it. And you can say some, uh, this is how I would say, I did not observe indications of a defect at the time of the inspection at the roof covering material, right? According to home inspection standards of practice, a home inspection report, oh, wait, there are a few other things the gutters, the downspouts, the vents, flashings, and chimney roof penetrations, the general structure of the, you have to inspect all of those things and we'll get to them too. According to the home inspection standards of practice, home inspection report shall identify in written format defects. Well, this is the sentence that I would put in the, in the report about the roof. I did not observe indications of a defect at the time of the inspection in relation to the roof. So according to the standards of practice, a home inspection report shall identify in written format defects 
within specific systems and components defined by the standards that are both observed and deemed to be material. Material, like, uh, like cloth or, or concrete or wood, that kind of, no. Material means really serious. Like there's a, a degree to which there is a hazard to it. This is very serious. A material defect, well, it's defined in the standards of practice, but it's basically something so bad that it poses an unreasonable risk to someone's health or safety, or it devalues the home so much, has an, a, a bad effect on the value of the home. Like for example, I've inspected homes that are just filled with water, there's a flood and mold, molds everywhere. Right, that's a material defect. A material, another example of a material defect is a deck that has a, a flashing problem and it's no longer attached securely to the house is a common defect because it's a very difficult thing that the deck ledger uh, has been installed improperly for many years. There's a lot of decks that are, um, a deck collapse is eminent. That means it shall happen. The deck will collapse. When that deck is in that condition, that's a material defect poses an unreasonable risk to someone's health and safety. Inspection reports can include other recommendations and comments, but the material defect is the main one, only one, that you're required to put in a report. It's the only one that's identified in the standards of practice. And it's clearly identified that it is both observed and deemed to be material. Let's say I'm doing a home inspection right here. I'm in my home office here. And there's a defect above my head. It's a material defect. What if I don't see it? Then I can't possibly report upon it. There could be a defect in the middle of the wall, right? Underneath the carpeting, that could be a material defect. I have no idea. I can't report upon it because it wasn't observed. Let's say there's a defect that I see. Oh, look at the, look at this, that, that there. But I don't deem it to be really bad. It's a stain on the carpet. Am I required to report upon it? No. I'm only required to report upon the defects that I both observe and deem to be material. If I can't see it, I can't report upon it. And if it's not, um, not up to the definition of a material defect, it won't be in the report either. However, if you're new to this, you'll find out that consumers demand that you put almost everything in the report, even the little stain in the carpet. So it's really up to you to put in cosmetic items or minor issues or minor defects. But you're, when it comes to um, defending yourself, let's say in a court, the standards of practice are really important because it clearly defines what you are required to do and not required to do, what you are required to report upon and not required to report on. Are there other types of defects that I could observe? There are. Some of them are defined and you can define them as well. If you go to the InterNACHI's glossary, we have um, a lot of definitions and terminology there. So if you type in defect in the search field. Oops, defect search class right through. So you have um, some results. There's the material defect. That's a significant issue, right? Um, that poses an unreasonable risk to people or has a significant adverse impact on the value of the property. That's a material defect. There's major defect. Um, something's wrong and you need a contractor to fix it. A minor defect, there's something wrong, but typically the homeowner or the contractor can fix it. And a cosmetic defect, um, that's a superficial flaw or blemish in something, it's no big deal. So th there are other defects. What about code violations? Well, as we said before earlier in the class, home inspectors are not code inspectors. However, you may want to refer to code to study study code, but I highly recommend not specifically referring to code or mentioning code or saying the word code because people will think that you are actually inspecting a home 
for code violations. And if you're inspecting a home that has been lived in, that is not brand new, that was not built to modern today's code, if it was built yesterday or the year before or five years ago or 20 years ago, it's almost guaranteed that it's gonna have a code violation. For example, the, the, why is that? Because code changes. The codes change. Every three years, codes change. The electrical codes change, the residential codes change, the commercial codes change, the fire codes for sure change. So when a home was built, an existing home, and you're performing a home inspection on an existing home and it's 20 years old, there's probably gonna be some code violations in there and you don't want to go down that path. I'll, I'll show you why. Hold on a second. Let me go to my library. I don't know if you can see this. So I'm gonna bring it over to the camera. Okay, so this is um, International Residential oh, International Residential Code and Commentary, Volume 1 and 2. Oh, I love reading these. Yeah, this is about, this is code. This is the code book. So if you're a code inspector, this is your homework. This is your main reference. You got to know all this stuff. Oh, that's not what we are. And when there's a, a little violation of a code, you got to be able to refer to it and look and point and say it's uh, R608.4.1. That's not what home inspectors are all about. Excuse me, I dropped some things. So um, a code violation, it could be mentioned by a home inspector for sure. So in a handrail, in a guard, in a guard, a guard rail, like, you know, top rail and there's spindles, right? The, the space between the spindles can't be large enough for a four inch sphere to pass through them. That's large enough for a child's head to fall through. Now that's a code violation, but I'm not gonna say anything. I'm gonna say it as a defect. And I really don't care when the house is built. Because we all know right now that child can fall through. If my client has a little baby, that space in there, that's a safety hazard for that kid. That's a child hazard. That's a risk. And I can easily point that out to my client without mentioning code at all. As a home inspector, I can call that out. Let's say my client has a, a physical challenge and I can see, I can visually, I see that my client needs help going up steps when there's more than one riser, more than one. When there's two or more risers, my client needs help. And that's okay. We all need a little help, right? Code, code says four or more risers. Code requires a handrail when there's four or more risers. Four, forget it. My client that I'm working for can't go up one without assistance. Can't, can't make it to the third one without a handrail without a hand, without help. I know that I'm gonna side on the air of my client. I'm gonna err on the side of my client and I'm gonna recommend a handrail because I'm not a code inspector. See, I, I'm a home inspector. I can comment upon things. I can think about code, but if it doesn't make any sense, I'm not a code inspector. Code inspector would say, well, you don't need a handrail there. It's not four risers, it's only two, sorry. So it's really fun to be a home inspector. It must really stink to be a code inspector because you're stuck in this and you're stuck in this world and it doesn't change. And you're stuck in when was the house built kind of attitude. I could care less when the house was built. If there's a missing GFCI in the bathrooms, if there's missing GFCI in the kitchen, I don't care when the house was built. It could be a hundred year old Victorian home. We need some GFCIs there to protect people from getting electrocuted. And if it's a brand new home, totally opposite, it better have GFCI protection. So is there anything in between that I care what age it is? No, I don't care what age the house is. That's not a policy of internet or anything like that. It's my own personal opinion, but it may work for you. Think about why you care what the house age is when you're performing an inspection. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, I'm required to inspect the roof covering materials, the gutters, they look good, the downspouts, 
There's the downspouts, diverting water away. Got some splash blocks there. Very nice. Okay. I wonder where that water is going to go though. It's kind of flat. Vents. We saw a ridge vent. We saw a soffit vent. And that's the ridge vent from the inside because sometimes the builders forget that there's a ridge vent. I don't know how they do it. And they, they don't cut. So sometimes they'll, they'll put the panel boards up to the ridge and leave a little space and some, or sometimes they'll come up to the top and then cut. Um, so that's the underside of the ridge vent. I like to see that. And the soffit vents. So there's, there's uh, these soffit trays. There's some um, blocking of, there's some fiberglass bats to stop the, the loose fill fiberglass from clogging the vents on the, on the roof. Okay, we'll get that out later maybe. There's flashing that I have to inspect. That's anything that goes through the roof covering materials. It's gonna intersect it. You need to flash it up. So the vent pipes need flashing. There's a collar flashing around the chimney. There's flashing where um, a roof section meets anything else, like a wall, a vertical wall. So there's some wall flashing here, right? And here too. So I'm gonna look at there, but it's really a visual only inspection. However, I might see some metal flashing and I'm, I'm likely going to see it on that top row of shingles. Maybe it's covering, that'd be really nice to see. So I'm gonna take a look at that as well. Oh, and there's my aluminum ladder, 40 foot aluminum. Um, according to the standards of practice, I'm required to inspect the vents, flashing skylights. Well, we don't have any skylights on this house. The chimney, that's essentially the chimney. Type B, B vent, metal, coming through the roof. There's the flashing, the collar flashing. That looks pretty good. It's a little sloppy with the, the nail on the side. I, you know, they didn't have to do that. And there's the underside. So obviously I didn't go back and forth. I'm, I'm just on the roof, but for this presentation, I, I kind of combined some of my inspection uh, photos for you. And that's, that chimney is for the gas-fired heating system. And roof penetrations, Any, anything that penetrates the roof. So obviously the roof, uh, the, the vent stacks. And I'm required to inspect the general structure of the roof from the readily accessible panels, doors, and stairs. So I'm always trying to get into the attic space. And there's the attic space built with trusses and I'm looking at the underside and I can't get to that area that I wanted to get to. Do you remember the satellite dish and the fasteners? They're always leaking, I can't get to it. And that's okay. Are you required to inspect everything? No. Let's say that the roof is leaking right underneath that satellite dish and I can't get to it. Am I responsible for that defect? In fact, the question is, am I responsible for every defect in a home? No, there could be defects all over the place, all over the place. And I'm not responsible to see them, I'm not responsible to find them, I'm not responsible to report upon them. If I can't find them, there's defects all over the place. There's defects within the walls. There's probably a defect somewhere underneath my feet. I have no idea about it, right? It's likely, but I'm not required to find every defect in a home. I'm not required to report upon every defect. So if I can't get to it, I'm just gonna tell my client I can't get to that underside. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall describe the type of roof covering material. Well, asphalt shingle, right? According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall report as a need of correction, observe indications of active roof leaks. Active roof leaks. Well, I didn't see any. Second system is the exterior. So the, the standards of practice, I kind of follow those standards of practice when I perform a home inspection. It kind of fits the way I perform a home inspection process. My inspection process is just like the standards of practice. They reflect, they mirror one another. So my report is also written in the same way. The first section of the standards of practice is the roof. And that's the first thing that I inspect. And that's the first thing that I write about and read in my inspection report, roof. Second thing, exterior. Second system of the standards of practice. That's the second thing that I inspect because I come down from the roof and I take a look at the exterior, right? Some inspectors, and it's the second thing in my inspection report, it's, it's the second thing in my inspection process. And 
on and on, right? Some inspectors start in the kitchen. Fantastic. As long as you inspect everything according to the standards of practice, you can move things around if you wanted to. You can do the kitchen first or the kitchen last. That's where I end up. I, I like to end up in the heart of the house. That's the kitchen where coffee is made and uh, the summary is reviewed and I finalize things and I get paid and shake hands and we talk about things and we head on off to the next job. I like to end my inspection in the kitchen and start it at the roof, but it's really up to you. Let's see, do we have questions? Okay, uh, let me click through a couple. Thanks for doing this. They, oh, you're welcome, you're welcome. The videos are great, thank you. Um, getting credit, yes, you can get credit. Jed says, you can't be walking upon the roof to inspect them unless the slope is too steep. Yep, the worst thing that I ever did once during a home inspection is I followed a roofer up on the roof. He used my ladder. I was like, okay, go ahead. And we went up and we, I followed him and it was difficult to get back down. It's so easy to go up. And when you're following a roofer, I didn't have that much experience. I used to be a home builder, I installed roofs, but I didn't have that. So, so don't ever follow a roofer up on the, on the roof. Um, Richard makes a recommendation. Please, please invest in a pair of cougar paws if you walk on roofs. I uh, won't get any other, he won't use any other shoe. That's really good. Cougar paws, um, Inspector Outlet sells the cougar paw uh, boot. It's really good. Um, JRD, would you recommend shadowing or paralleling for a few inspections after becoming certified by NACHI? No, I would do it before. <laughs> it all depends. So um, I would, I would, if I was, I say that because I've taken people along in my truck and the first thing I do is, you know, like we're not gonna do anything unless you're certified. I mean, we can't even use the same terminology. We can't even talk about the same stuff. That's really exciting to me and, you know, unless you're certified. So go online and complete your certification requirements. Do it in a month or two. Uh, Internet G membership is $49 a month. And that's all you pay. That's no other fee, $49 a month. And you can get certified as a home inspector, $49 a month, learn at your pace. So you get certified. And start working on inspecting homes, starting with your own home. Inspect your home 10 times with software or we have checklists that you can use if you don't want to invest in software right now, or free download, downloadable checklists, electronic checklists. You can do mock inspection reports using our software. It's free software, very basic software, right? So perform inspections like crazy. And then when you have that type of experience, you can actually then be competent enough to actually help another home inspector who's been doing this for a while. Right, it's difficult when you're just like, just want to ride around and you have no idea what you're doing. So what you want to do is go through an online, free online accredited home inspector certificate program uh, at $49 a month, right? And um, then find a mentor in your area. And Internachi has a mentoring program. We have a long list of veteran master inspectors who have agreed to volunteer their time to teach other inspectors. So we have a mentoring program. If you can't find it, it's at natchiorg slash mentoring, and you can find a, a local mentor in, in your area or a certified inspector in your area. Um, you may want to think about also going out of your market and finding someone who may want to help you because a lot of inspectors don't want to train their competitors. And you may want to find a chapter. We have a lot of chapters, home inspector chapters all over the world. Um, and there are a lot of master inspectors who sit in, in the chapter meetings and they have monthly meetings and they're willing to help you out as well. So a lot of resources, um, JRD. Um, Hector asks, um, as a, a home inspector in Florida, can I get a license as a termite inspector or should I just work with a third party. If I work with a third party, can I make income on that service or should I just have the client contact me and do the inspector? And John says, it's regulated here in Florida. Yeah, um, everywhere, every state regulates um, a pesticide applicator. Now here's the thing, <laughs> 
can you inspect in your house, uh, in your state, for anything that damages wood without talking about the actual bug, since you're not an entomologist, you're not going to identify the bug that is damaging wood. Are you able to talk about the damaged wood that you observe? That's a structural problem, right? Most states do not have that kind of problem. Florida is one of them. Florida, we got the Department of Agriculture and the DBPR licensing department to say that a home inspector can comment upon um, damaged wood, right? That was caused by a WDO, a wood destroying organism. But that inspector, he or she cannot say the word termite or, or any other bug, cannot identify the actual insect that caused the damage. That's the same thing in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, to fill out that WDO form, you gotta be a licensed pesticide applicator. I'm not doing that, but I'm a home inspector and I'm looking for anything that damages wood, right? Anything that damages wood, if it's a bug, I'll just call it a bug. Everybody knows what a bug is. And I'll wink at them and I'll say, I think you need a termite company to come out, right? And identify this and report and then control it. And you better negotiate that prior to moving in. And the bank probably wants to know as well. That was very valuable information that I was able to sell in my inspection services. 75% of all of my home inspections came with, we bundled a WDO inspection with them. We commented upon WDO legally in our state without being a licensed pesticide applicator because I wasn't spraying any pesticide, but I was a home inspector and I'm required to look upon, look for uh, material defects, especially those about the structure of the home, right? So it's a very fine line and actually has some resources for you, um, Hector to help you out on that. I actually have the quote from the licensing department, um, Department of Agriculture. Uh, Mike, um, Mike O'Keefe says, uh, I took your advice of another class and got up on the roof and took a shot of my foot. I hope you're talking about a camera. And drone is in, uh, Justin says, drone is credible to bring a home inspection. Is a drone, uh, something you should bring to a home inspection? Do you need a separate certificate? It's actually a federally regulated activity for commercial use. If you're flying a drone for commercial use, which you're talking about to inspect the home as a home inspector, a roof, um, uh, it's regulated. And you have to be an FAA pilot for an um, unmanned um, aerial vehicle. So InterNACHI helped, and there's a, uh, an exam you have to take, you have to take a pilot's exam from the FAA. And um, InterNACHI has some resources to help you with that. We have an online course and we have training videos uh, and we fly some of the drones as part of our training. Uh, David, what is your favorite software? Uh, that's a question I always say. Right now, I, 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 like, um, I like Spectora, HomeGage, Home Inspector Pro. Those are the three big ones. There are 3D, there's Easy. Um, there's a ton of software out there. I like the software that works on a mobile device that allows me to shoot videos and pictures easily and puts videos in my inspection report. And because I'm an internet chief member, I demand that software provider give me a discount, right? So um, that's the power of being an internet chief member. You can ask another uh, a provider or a vendor of the home inspection industry for special pricing, uh, insist on it. And if they don't, Hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, and that is um, at nachi.org slash everything, nachi.org slash everything. Scroll down to step 11 and you can find a ton of inspection report writing software resources, including links to the um, discounted software providers. Um, those software providers, if you click that link on step 11, nachi.org slash everything, um, they provide, they've agreed to provide um, members exclusive discounts on software. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, okay? All right. Learn how to inspect the exterior by visiting our education page and type exterior in the search field. We already did that. Um, according to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall inspect all this stuff on the exterior. It seems like a lot. It really isn't though. 
exterior wall covering materials. Why do we call it roof covering materials and exterior wall covering materials? Well, we talked about that a little bit because you don't want to comment upon the assembly of things. But there's one thing you should know. Internachi, um, Internachi, their, our training is based upon standards, best practices, and code. Our training is based upon code. And when the code takes an iteration, uh, goes through a, an update every three years, for, for example, um, 2020, I believe, uh, no, 2021, of their inter international residential code should be updated. So we're at 2018, right, 2021, the new code is coming up next year for the international residential code. And when, during that iteration, during that upgrade, we do a curriculum review because we're a university. Other schools don't have to do that. <laughs> Internet she does because we're an accredited college for home inspectors. So what, whenever there's an upgrade to the code, we review our entire curriculum. It takes months and we make updates and revisions based upon code upgrades because, well, like the fire code, when the fire code gets revised and is upgraded and is updated, it's probably because, unfortunately, you know, somebody got hurt when, it, when it's related to the fire code. And we know that. So when the smoke detector requirements gets upgraded, updated, that's how we train our home inspectors. And even our veteran inspectors who need to take the uh, online home inspector exam gets hit with that updated question. And they have to know what a, um, a safe, healthy home is all about. It's about code and standards, right? So terminology is very important too. Don't be a code inspector, but use the same terminology. Uh, and here we have wall covering. You can call it siding, but code really uses wall covering or wall covering materials and it's chapter seven of the 2018 International Residential Code. And chapter seven establishes the various types of materials, standards, methods of application permitted as interior and exterior wall covering. Interior uh, coverings include like the plaster and the drywall, but exterior wall covering is regulated by this section, it includes aluminum, stone, masonry, veneer, wood, hardboard, particle board, wood structural panel siding, wood shakes and shingles, exterior plaster, steel, and vinyl. And it's, I don't know about you, but when you become a, an inspector and you wanna learn more, the code books become kind of fun, especially this. Um, let's see, is it that? One of these, here's the table. It's table R703.3. One, um, so here's minimum attachment and minimum thickness. So on the left side is the siding material, all these types of siding material. There's insulated vinyl siding, and there's poly polypropylene siding, uh, vinyl siding right here. And it tells you if it needs to be lapped or not and what kind of um, ring shank nails or fasteners are needed and how do you, tr how do you treat the jo joint? Is it up against each other or do they lap? That's really great. How thick is it? What kind of uh, materials are underneath it? Is it uh, a ventilated? Is it drainage? This code is really cool. And InterNACHI's courses are based upon that. That's why InterNACHI inspectors are the best inspectors in the whole world because they all are required to pass accredited online curriculum. All of our courses have been reviewed and abide by and comply with national standards for a university. So here's the vinyl siding. Vinyl siding, vinyl siding, vinyl siding, vinyl, vinyl, even the shutters are vinyl. There's some wood there and I'll take a look at the bottom where it's in contact with the asphalt or the concrete uh, of, the, of the garage. But there's the vinyl siding. I take a ton of pictures. I'm required to inspect the eaves, soffit, and fascia. There's the soffit and the, you know, the fascia is behind the gutter and the, the whole thing is kind of the eaves. The representative number of windows. I can't get to the second floor windows from down here. I'm not humping a ladder all the way around. That's what roosters call them. So um, 
it's really just a representative number that I can access. So while I'm inside, uh, there's inspection restrictions there too. Like there's furniture blocking the window, um, curtain, blinds blocking the window. I can't get to everything. So the visual only inspection with a lot of restrictions, all exterior doors. So representative number of windows, but all of the exterior doors, especially the main egress door. And there's the main egress door, which means that's the front door. And I'm looking for damage and trip hazards. There's a little bit of uh, minor paint. That's a cosmetic defect. Remember the definitions of different defects? That's a cosmetic one. I'm not even gonna mention it in my report, but I'm gonna take a picture of it for sure. Oh, slider door on the back of the house. How many risers do you see? One, two, three, four. It's essentially five, five risers. Is there a handrail? Defect. I would call it out if there were two steps, two risers, and no handrail. But that's my privilege as a home inspector. There's torn screen, no big deal. Uh, I have it as a comment in my inspection software, um, just a real quick tap that I've observed some of the screens. I don't even identify which window it was because there's it's, it's like a minor thing. I don't want people to focus on it. Um, so I'll just talk about torn screens or loose screens. I'm trying to get to the major defects, like the missing handrail when there's five risers. Adjacent walkways and driveways, I gotta inspect that. So, you know, there I am, there's my truck and the asphalt looks great. Stairs, stoops, stairs, steps, stoops, stairways and ramps. <laughs> Say that 10 times. And that looks really good. Um, again, um, there's the handrail. And if you're wondering about um, handrails and things like that, go to chapter three, section R311.7.8, R311.7.8, and talks about handrails. And it says, handrails shall be provided on not less than one side of each flight of stairs with four or more risers. And then there's a little commentary. So I like the commentary um, and it's all about safety. Um, so uh, I'm not a code inspector and uh, I err on the side of my client. And if my client thinks oh, I need a handrail, I don't care about what code says for, I'm gonna say two. Uh, porches, patios, decks, balconies, and carports. I really don't have a lot of things. There's a little patio back there with bricks. Um, railings, guards, and handrails. We got that, the handrail, right? And there's no other guards around the place. Vegetation, surface drainage, retaining walls, and grading of the property where they may adversely affect the structure due to moisture intrusion. There's a retaining wall, but it's really like a gardening thing. It's not, has nothing to do with the house itself. And the grading of the property is kind of flat. So where the downspouts discharge hundreds of gallons of water on the ground, it's really kind of flat. Uh, walking around, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of dry, so I'm not sure. I'm actually just going to comment upon the, the grading of the property. It should be really sloped. I like a, a drop of about six inches in the first 10 feet or so, maybe a little swale or something, but this is completely flat, absolutely flat. It must be squishy. And do you see that in the picture? For those of you who are listening to our Home Inspector podcast, in the back of the picture, there's a pipe coming out of the vinyl siding just above the foundation wall, which is poor concrete and discharges at the corner of the house that there's a sump pump discharge pipe. There it is. So now, remember I'm doing the roof first and then the exterior. Now I have to think about how, mm, see a house is a system of interdependent parts. Each part is connected to other parts. And when one part fails, it may affect other parts and make the home mm, less healthy, less safe. So now I have to think, there's a discharge pipe coming from some pump here. The grading is flat. I'm thinking water problems, which can still happen with a poured concrete, reinforced poured concrete foundation like this. Water can, water is a, a killer. It, it, it is a destroyer. It brings life, but it can destroy water and it can find its way in the, in the smallest little cracks. And it's so much fun to track it down. And there's a, a, a sump pump discharge pipe. I remember, I haven't even seen the basement yet, but I think there's a basement, right? It's not a crawl space, I'm thinking. 
it could be a crawl space and I got a sump pump and I got flat grating and a lot of water possibly. So I have to put all that together in my head while I'm doing the exterior. And then remember that, um, remember I haven't been inside the house. So I haven't actually, although I've showed you the picture of the attic, I haven't been inside that. So I have to think about, can I get to that satellite with the four fasteners, lag bolts, and they put some silicone on the head of the lag bolt. Like that's gonna help, right? So there could be an active roof leak. There could be an active water penetration problem. I know that there's a sump pump. Why is there a sump pump? I don't know. Is it active? I don't know. It's, a, it's ground, it's dry, I don't know. But here's the picture of the sump pump that I finally got to. So I have to think of a house being, this is the story that you're telling your clients, that the house is a system of parts and all the parts kind of work together. And when there's something a little off, right, then when the filter is clogged, then the lungs of the house are kind of dirty, right? Love telling stories about houses. Oh, according to the standards of practice, an inspector shall describe the type of exterior wall coverings, obviously vinyl, vinyl is a good term. And the inspector shall report as a need of correction, any improper spacing between um, in intermediate balusters, spindles and rails. Well, we don't even have a handrail at that rear step for the siding. Next, the standards of practice requires me to inspect the basement foundation crawl space and structure. According to the home inspection standards of practice, the inspector shall inspect the foundation, the basement, crawl space, and structural components. Here's a couple of pictures I took. I just walk around and pictures are, they're free, man, you know? So I'm taking pictures. I have, uh, I use this, right? This is my, this is my device. And it's, it's perfectly designed to take a lot of pictures because um, I can take pictures with my thumb. Can you see that? See where my thumb is located or right there. That's where I can take a picture. So man, I am shooting like crazy. Any kind of picture that I can take because they're free. Free and free words. Pictures worth a thousand words, free thousands of words. So there's the, oh. That tool is actually a gardening tool. I love this gardening tool. And you can get this gardening tool. I don't think ins Inspector Outlet sells it. Inspector Coach, Inspector Coach, InspectorCoach.com, InspectorCoach.com, InspectorCoach.com has tools. Um, you go to the tools tab and it's a three time gardening hoe. It's extendable. And you can really reach just about anything you wanted to reach. You heat this up, you know, you get your torch out. You heat one tine, tine, T-I-N-E, up, and kind of straighten it so you can poke things. So you can reach up and poke around, right, and down and over. And you keep these guys hooked so you can do exactly what I, I'm doing there. And I'm moving insulation. I, I'm not required to move insulation, but I love moving insulation especially under a, si um, a slider door or a deck area that's attached to the house right there at the ledger board band rim joist. And I move the installation, take a picture and I put it back. No one knows, right? Move the installation, take a picture, put it back. Oh, there's my internet G flashlight. Take a picture, move back, okay. And then foundation, oh, there's a crack. Hmm, it's hairline. It's at the corner of a window. It's not bigger than a, a key or a quarter, thickness of a quarter. And it's kind of been patched with silicone, but I see watermarks mm, coming from the crack. Oh, they're not wet, uh, but the trough is. So that's a perimeter trough, a drainage trough purposely installed. It's a floating slab, so the concrete slab of the basement is actually floating. It's not attached to the foundation. There are houses built on slab. There are houses that where the foundation wall and the, and the floor structure are poured all at once and they're together. This isn't. The concrete uh, slab is poured at a different time than the foundation. So they're separate. There's a trough to collect water and, and to have a separation. And there's mud marks coming from the cracks of the foundation 
pour concrete foundation. It's reinforced pour concrete foundation. It's one of the best types of foundations in the United States and in, in Europe. Also, they do concrete. Uh, it's been hit with some silicone, gray silicone, <laughs> poorly too. It's just, just. So what would you say in your report? You observed this. You, you got to say something. Can't not comment on it when it involves water. Now, remember, I'm now at my third system, roof, exterior, and I remember house is a system of interdependent parts. And I've got a sump pump discharge pipe outside and I got neutral, flat, flat grading. It's not sloped away from the house. And now I have water marks coming through the foundation that's cracked. There's a lot going on. It's okay. We have training specifically for this. As, as your home inspector, after the training, you'll know what to say. So let me tell you what I would say. It's not a structural problem. There's no displacement. It's actually a common shrinkage crack. It's commonly found. And sometimes it's common enough in certain uh, climate areas, geographical areas, um, where there, you'll see water coming through. And it's even then not a structural problem. And it's an easy fix. They, they drill and uh, they squirt epoxy into the crack and it seals it up, stops water from coming in. And it's a structural repair as well. The actual strength of the epoxy injection is stronger than the concrete itself. And that's my recommendation. But the real estate agent is gonna say, is it wet today? I said, nope, it's not wet. I don't even care. If it's dry watermarks, I'm glad that the seller left them. They could have wiped them up. They, it's like not painting over a watermark in the drywall ceiling below the attic. I'm glad that they didn't paint it over it. Now I see the watermark. Is it wet? No, it's dry, but I bet it's an indication of something. Why would they leave watermarks on the ceiling of the second floor bedroom underneath the roof, right? Maybe it's a roof leak. We should ask the owner. So that I'm going to make a recommendation for this to be epoxy injected, repaired, to stop the water leak. Even though it's not wet today, there's water marks on top of the silicone, right? On, coming through the crack. It doesn't have to be wet. It doesn't have to be pouring. Just observed indications of an active roof leak. Observed indications of an active water intrusion problem coming through the foundation crack epoxy injection recommended uh, uh, by a professional, right? And it'll fix the water problem and it'll fix any structural problem as well. And I don't think it's a structural problem. It's just normal shrinkage crack. Hope that was valuable to you. That's how I handle things like that. I don't freak out either. I'm just telling a story to my client. This is a story. It looks like you got a crack, normal shrinkage crack, concrete cracks when it dries, it shrinks and cracks in certain areas and it cracked right where I would expect it, right at a corner of a window. There's no displacement, there's no movement, there's no expansion. It's, it's a hairline crack and we've got some water coming through. It's not bad, it's not coming on the floor, it's not flooding right now, but I do have a sump pump on the, in the basement and it's active and I want you to take care of it. It discharges outside, there's a sump pump, the check valve, it's plugged in. I can't take the cover off because they actually poured concrete on top of the cover, which is unfortunate, but I can stick my camera in there. There isn't any standing water. That's a good thing, but it sure looks muddy and a little damp at the bottom. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really good recommendation to get that, to get that repaired and to tell the story of this water intrusion issue, just like that. Because when you are talking to your client, oh, a real estate agent say that we kill the deal. We actually don't. I was successful, I would say, because I told the story of my client's house to my client as if they found their dream home and they're going to move in. And what are they going to do? Well, they either fix this problem before they move in or when they move in, 
this problem is still going to exist and it may leak and you're gonna to have to get it epoxy injected. Really? Yeah. So I told that story with a smile straight up. I didn't try to patty cake it, patty cake it. I didn't try to soften it. I just told it as a defect. This is a major defect that needs to be fixed. Fix is easy. Uh, some pump, some pump. According to home inspection standards practice, the inspector shall describe the type of foundation, poured concrete foundation, and the location of the access to the underfloor crawl space so we don't have a clerk crawl space. We do have uh, essentially a college textbook. It's structural issues for home inspectors. If you wanted to know about how to inspect and report upon defects that you observe in relation to the foundation crawl space, poured concrete, things like that, um, there's the textbook there. Um, let's go to the textbook page. There are other textbooks. We have 12 other textbooks. This is the textbook here for structural issues. You can click to purchase it. And you, if you click to purchase it, you go to our e-commerce partner, inspectoroutlet.com, and you buy the, the book. And this is a book for 10 bucks. I don't know. I don't know any college textbook for just 10 bucks. That's a pretty good deal. Inspector Outlet, thanks. Um, if you can't find it, you go to any natcha.org page. And um, I don't know how I entered that symbol, but um, go to any natcha.org page. And at the top right corner, there's a magnifying glass right there. And you start typing to search all of, so if you go concrete, uh, this is fantastic. Look at all the resources about concrete, concrete for exterior and uh, shrinkage cracks and history of concrete. How about visual inspection of concrete? Oops, darn it, I keep doing that. Let's go to that article. And this is written by Nick Ramico, founder of Internachi, and Kenton Shepard, a certified master inspector. And if you wanted to look at these fantastic pictures, let me show you some of these pictures in this article. It's really good. Don't let, don't let what did I say before? If you're not confident or you feel, well, someone said that you don't feel uh, anxious about doing an inspection or something because they don't know. At the root of all, um, uh, having a feeling of, not being uh, inadequate or not feeling confident or not being sure, right? Not being able to be assertive or confident in your work. It's just because um, uh, you lack knowledge. And so that's where internet actually comes in. I've seen this type of condition before, have you? In concrete services, yeah, we explain what they are. There's efflorescence, we explain that. There's that kind of cracking, the pattern cracking, and there's, this cracking in the basement, or I've seen that before in the garage, right? Right, it's a shrinkage crack. There's control joints cracking, and there's that corner cracking. There's another, I've seen that on the walk, right? So um, if you're wondering about cracks and how they develop, there's crack there, right? The big crack in the back of a detached garage where the concrete was poured, but then cracked, and then there's water marks and efflorescence. Fantastic. And how do you fix those things? There's a public sidewalk and there's displacement. That's a trip hazard there caused by inadequate compaction. If you're wondering, if you're nervous or you feel weak in a certain area, take advantage of InterNACHI's online courses, right? It's fantastic. Um, According to Home Inspection Standards of Practice, you shall report as a need of correction any observed indications of wood in contact with or near soil, any observed indications of active water penetration, but if it's dry, right, I would report upon it anyways. I mean, real estate agents love like, well, is it, is it dripping right now? No, it's not dripping. Is the roof leaking right now? No, no, but I have a bucket underneath a hole in the roof, right? So I'm gonna report upon it. Um, observe indications of possible foundation movement, such as, such as cracks or out of square things, any observed cutting, notching, or boring of framing members, um, right there, uh, is the, uh, well, I don't have any structural problems with the, the floor structure, the wooden structure. Next, heating. I have to inspect the heating using normal operating controls. What's that? That's the thermostat. And that's the shutoff switch, the service switch on the side. 
and there's an emergency shutoff valve, uh, sorry, so shutoff switch. So that's usually uh, sometimes at the top of the steps so that if there's something crazy going on at the appliance, the heating system, uh, like smoking or something, you turn off the electricity from a safe distance. And we have a free gas furnace inspection checklist available right there. We have a ton of checklists available. If you're wondering how to inspect a furnace, we have a furnace checklist. Uh, if you're wondering how to perform a basic home inspection, like to get experience, like inspecting your friend's home 10 times, we have all these checklists for you. Here's a pool and spa checklist. Here's a radon mitigation inspection checklist. So that's a vertical market. Like if you're performing a home inspection, you should be using this phrase while I'm here. Let's say you're performing a home inspection, you come across a radon mitigation system that was installed 10 years ago. You know it's out of code, out of standard, because they've upgraded it. Well, we have a checklist for that. You can turn your head like this and say, while I'm here, do you want me to inspect this radon mitigation system? I see it's already whack. I mean, the, the fan is in the basement. And, you know, you can't have that. And the exhaust pipe is within reach of the ground. Can't have that. And I'm also uh, certified to do a radon test. And that's really the only way you know that the radon mitigation system is working or not by testing it. So <clears throat> let's see, what did we do? We did um, home inspections, radon, and termite. Now, in certain areas of the country, radon is not a problem. But uh, according to the EPA, thank goodness for the EPA, it's the second leading cause in lung cancer. And if you're in an area like I am right now, I'm in Colorado, one out of two homes have elevated levels of radon. So if you're a home inspector in Colorado, you're also a radon inspector. And if you're smart enough in your marketing strategies, you combine those two services in a bundle because people love to buy bundles of things. That's a uh, Happy Meal. You know what Happy Meal is? Yeah, it's separate things combined into one discounted package. People love bundles. So if my home inspection was $400 and my radon is 150, you combine them, it's $550. Let's go 450 if you do both. I would love to do, a, in fact, I was disappointed when we got to a home inspection and didn't make five, $600 on that home inspection because we had a $400 home inspection and we had ancillary services, a radon, a water, we do mold, you do a bunch of ancillary services and you bundle all that together. And if you get to a home inspection and you're, you're just doing a home inspection, oh, the worst thing is to see a, a mold inspector come in. Turn to your client and say, while I'm here. In fact, do I have marketing while I'm here? We have marketing for you around here somewhere that helps a home inspector, an energy home inspector, market their ancillary services while they're at the home inspection. So if I'm in the basement, right, and there's a serious water problem and it's wet, it smells a little musty, you know, I could turn to my client and say, you know, while I'm here, if you're concerned about mold, you know, um, if I see mold, you really don't need to test it. That's what the EPA says. But I really don't see mold growth. And if you want me to swab it, I got a swab. Or if you want me to do a lab sampling, I could do that as well, because I'm certified through InterNACHI as a mold inspector. And some areas regulate that, like Florida regulates mold inspectors. So you have to be careful about local uh, regulations. Well, anyways, we have a mold inspection checklist in the standards of practice. We have a checklist for wood destroying organisms. We have an electrical panel checklist, all kinds of checklists from InterNACHI. We also have videos. So if you're wondering about uh, sure. heating. <laughs> Great. Let's open this up. That's young me. Well, there was. So I wanted to show in that video, we have all kinds of training videos and articles and things like that, how impossible it is for a home inspector to find a crack in a heat exchanger. It's impossible. I tear open a gas fired heating system right there. You can't find it. Don't worry about cracked heat exchangers. That's like, they've been talking about uh, home inspectors and cracked uh, heat exchangers for 20 years and those old home inspector 
schools way back when that cost you thousands of dollars and you got to sit in class for five days and the, to make it exciting, the instructor will talk about finding a crack in a heat exchanger. And you look in the textbooks and sure enough, they got a whole chapter on finding a crack in a heat exchanger. Now, it's impossible for a home inspector to comment upon finding a crack in a heat exchanger. But you do, you can comment upon the, the type of heating system. Now, my favorite book is the International Fuel Gas Code. Um, chapter five is a good chapter. The code puts furnaces in four categories based upon flue vent pressures, flue gas temperatures, relating to whether it condenses or doesn't condense, and vent pipe materials. And we have a table here. Let's take a look at the table a little bit closer. So from 10 feet away, you should be able to identify the type of heating system based upon the training that you've received through InterNACHI, uh, either by text, textbook, articles, videos. So if you feel weak in a certain area, like we had a student say, uh, uh, my weak part is electrical, no problem. We got you covered. According to the standards, you got to describe the location of the thermostat of the heating system. There it is there. The energy source got some gas. Oh, it's actually, oh, that's not natural gas. It's, ah, propane, propane tank, underground storage, uh, it's the first time I ever saw gravel on top. They usually just bury the whole thing. And there's the propane tank there. Remember, I'm not required to inspect anything that's buried. It's a visual only inspection. There's a gas shutoff valve there. The heating method, you blow air around that and ducts. Inspector shall report as a need of correction any heating system that didn't operate or if the heating system was deemed inaccessible, no problems there. There's an emergency shutoff switch service switch on uh, the controls were available. It's, oh, and uh, is it, is this, um, what type of heating system is this? Is this category four, category one, two or three, right? So it's not natural draft. They don't make them anymore. You may come across one, but it's um, not high, it's not category four either. It's not condensing. So the flue gas vent uh, is in plastic and it's not um, collecting condensate and discharging it outside. Uh, so, it's, so it's something else. <laughs> and it moves air around. Uh, there's the air filter, and it's being sucked into the blower fan, the circulating fan, so that's not good. Um, minor defect, I, I personally would label this as a minor defect. Homeowners should be able to fix uh, filters. So um, there's a piece of the filter actually at the bottom of the, the uh, below the circulating fan, the blower, and has been serviced and cleaned. I like to take pictures of the service tag. Um, HVAC systems should be serviced and cleaned every year. This is one of my easy things that I did as a home inspector. I just took a look at the date. If it was more than a year, I made a recommendation for an HVAC technician to come in and perform further evaluation and service on the HVAC system that I just inspected. Why? Oh, before closing, all of your recommendations should be, um, should be triggered right after your home inspection. Your client should not wait and make those uh, and take action on those recommendations. My recommendations to my client were to be taken prior, or just after the inspection and prior to them closing on the house, prior to them moving in because I'm a home inspector doing a visual only inspection. If I say that there's something wrong with um, the HVAC system that hasn't been serviced and cleaned in over a year and it really should be cleaned every year, the HVAC technician may find a problem that I didn't see. Maybe I'm not even qualified to see. I'm not even trained in that. I don't take things apart. He, he she is going to test the unit. I don't know what those flashing codes are. There's a little light on the on modern ones, you know, by the blower fan on the panel, on the motherboard, you know, ding, 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 ding. I don't, I'm not going to look at those. I don't have time to look at that. I don't know what that blinking light means. Could mean something, right? I want my client to take full advantage of my recommendations by getting a professional in there to evaluate further and make any necessary corrections, particularly on things that I didn't even see. And that's okay by me because I'm not a contractor. I can't 
tear things apart like a contractor can. You know, if I say that the flashing at the deck ledger is missing, correction by professional is recommended prior to closing, great. Further evaluation better be in there too. That contractor is gonna lift the siding, take things apart, maybe even pull the deck off. I don't know. And they're definitely gonna find more stuff than I can see. So I don't know what the, the disconnect is between home inspectors and contractors. A lot of contractors will come in and just bash the home inspector and say things like, well, your home inspector should have found that. Oh, it just drives me crazy. No, we're visual only inspectors. We're generalists. We're not experts and we're not code inspectors and we're not taking things apart like you are. You have taken the siding off the house. Of course, you're gonna find problems that I didn't see, you know? And actually contractors should be networking with home inspectors because we make them money. We essentially, at the end of my inspection, I have created a list of things to do for the homeowner and most homeowners can't do anything like home maintenance and repair and renovations and things like that. So they go to a contractor. So they find contractors. Contractors should be networking with home inspectors because we generate work for contractors. So there's the um, flashing from the vent pipe going up through the roof, right? And there's the ductwork and there's a register. Ever pull off a floor register and stick your hand in there and pull out nails from when the house was built? Yep. Um, a lot of ducts have never been cleaned and serviced and some of my clients are sensitive to those things. So I'll be sensitive to that as well. I'll err on the side of my client. In relation to the cooling system, I'm, inspect, I'm required to inspect the cooling system using normal operating controls. There's the outdoor uh, unit, compressor unit, condenser, um, and the inside is the evaporator. Uh, there's a thermostat, and I'm required to inspect, uh, describe the location of the thermostat and the cooling method. There's a thermostat there, the cooling method, uh, split system air conditioning with ductwork. There's the evaporator coil, there's the refrigerant lines, um, liquid line I'm touching, the suction line is uh, insulated. There's the condensate pipe going around the unit and into the sump pump. It doesn't have a trap. I may comment upon that. Uh, the sump pump discharges outside. And there's the picture of the manufacturing label. I take a picture of all the manufacturing labels. I may put them in a report, may not. And there's the condensate discharge tube there it is there. Ideally, it would be directed more away from the house instead of towards the house. And there's the electrical disconnect, square D. Um, the unit, the condenser unit, the air conditioner unit uh, is on a nice stable base on some concrete footings. That's good. Report as a need of correction any cooling system that didn't operate or if the cooling system was inaccessible. We don't have any problems like that. The only problem was a shared defect, a minor defect about the filter being sucked into the blower fan with some pictures there that are worth a thousand words. And the cooling system too wasn't serviced or cleaned within a year. So I'm gonna make that as a recommendation. The next section is plumbing. Now, one of the things uh, that somebody asked about was software. And so um, let me show you my software. Let's see if I can do it. You know, I'm, I'm fairly good with technology until uh, it doesn't work very well. So let me show you. I'll show you my, my software. Because I see some questions about, I see a lot of questions about software. So here I am, there's all my apps. I got an iPhone, oh, sorry. There's my iPhone, right? And, uh, and I'm learning Spectora right now. And that's a shot of, a house and spectrum, so I'm gonna tap that. And then there's the, can you see this? How do I do it? So you can see, and I'm actually tapping, there's the roof. And view a reminder, you can have little notes to remind yourself. There are a couple optional systems and components in this section, right? So if there's like a, a masonry chimney, I can add that down here. Uh, I can add that item, but I'm not going to. So roof covering is a section. And, um, and there's a little paragraph about homeowner responsibility. 
And your job as a homeowner to, is to monitor the roof covering because I tell my client, any roof can leak. Um, and then uh, the type of roof covering is asphalt. And um, if I wanted to take a picture, I could take a picture. I simply like, there's me, right? That's a weird picture. Take a picture like that and I'll use that photo in the report and that goes right into the report itself. Um, and then the roof was inspected from a ladder and from the roof, roof sorry. And there were some limitations. I'm unable to see everything. Um, i unable to walk upon the roof surfaces. Well, I wasn't able to walk upon all the roof surfaces, so I'll leave that there. It wasn't covered by snow. Uh, do I have any problems? Uh, exposed fasteners at the, um, at the, um, the satellite dish, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and then I could do like arrows if I wanted to. I hate doing arrows, but I could. But because it was a problem, then uh, a major defect, then it gives you that option. And then I go back. And so the roof covering is done. And then I go to the flashing and I inspected these things and uh, there's no problems with the flashing and then the plumbing vent pipes and I get any problems with the venting gutters and downspouts, how many problems with that. And then I go back to the roof and then I'm going to stereo. So um, when I inspect the roof, it's about that fast. I, I inspect the roof in about 10 minutes. And if there's problems, then that slows me down. But if there aren't any problems, then uh, inspect the roof and I go click, 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 click. And I'm taking as many pictures as I can and even video, I'll do a video with my mobile device. And then um, when I step on my ladder to get down from the roof, before I step on it, I'm done inspecting the roof. I'm done inspect, uh, reporting upon the problems. I'm done writing the roof section because I have a mobile device with software. I'm done with the videos, I'm done. And when I come down the ladder, my client is gonna be in the driveway, remember? We time it just right. First impression, big smile, it's great to see you. I wanna inspect the heck out of this house, just like it was my own, right? We're gonna have some fun. I'd like to take you around the exterior right now, but let me tell you about the roof. It's in great shape. I did not observe any defects with the roof covering materials or any of the other systems or components that intersect with the roof. So we're good there, but I'll go in the attic space to look for roof leaks. I do have a concern about the satellite dish and the fasteners, but I'll, I'll see if I can find anything up there. Would you like to go around the exterior with me? And I go around the exterior in the same clock, the counterclockwise loop. And if they say yes, great, we go around. If they say no, good, I kick them inside. They want to take pictures. They want to measure and they want to look at the carpeting that they need to replace anyways, you know, and look at the refrigerator that may stay or may not. I don't know. They're going to do important things to them. I've already assured them that I'm highly qualified because we met on the roof. They saw me waving from the roof. Remember, that's part of my brand. I came down. But the point is, I'm done with the roof. And when I inspect the exterior in the next five, 10 minutes, I'm, and I'm gonna write up the exterior in my report and I'm done with the inspection of the roof, done with the inspection report of that section. So I'm writing as I'm inspecting. And at the end of the inspection, my report is done. I'm gonna click and click summary and the summary, the defects are going to come into the summary and I can, I can go over the summary. I only have one, remember? We, it's the fasteners of the satellite. But I can go over the summary with my client in the kitchen and then I'll tell them I can send in the report later. Nobody reads the full report. They just want the summary. My summary has little pictures and, and little recommendations and things like that and I can do it immediately. Why? Because I'm a master of my time. I'm time management master. And when you run a business, you have to manage your time. You have to manage yourself. You have to manage your equipment. You have to manage your money. You have to manage your marketing. You have to do it all, all by yourself. And the one thing that a lot of inspectors forget is their time, their most precious asset. If you're wasting time, you're not going to make any money. So for me, I know exactly how long it takes to do a home inspection on average. And at the end of the inspection, I don't have time to write the report at night. I have to give my client the call to action, the list of things to go fix that require possibly a contractor to come in and fix things and further evaluate. So I'm inspecting and writing a report so that I can get to the kitchen and click summary and summarize this whole story that I'm telling my client and give them what they need, which is tell me what I need to do after the inspection. 
Is everything okay? Right? That's what my client, I'm fulfilling my client's needs and my agent's needs. My agent just wants to go to closing. She or he just wants to fix those defects as fast as possible that are listed on the summary and get going. I'm going to fulfill their need as well immediately. And I'm managing my time. I can tell you if, if I start my home inspection at eight o'clock, I know when I'm going to be in the attic. It's at 10 o'clock. It takes me that long. I could do roof, exterior, and then the big systems, the big heavy things that Uncle Bob on a Saturday morning wants to look over my shoulder while I inspect. That's the heating system, the cooling system, the electrical, the plumbing, the hot water source foundation. And then I get to the attic and that's at 10 a.m. If I start at eight, because it takes me loud and all. I know that because I manage my time. And the most efficient way to manage your time nowadays is to get mobile software. So I think you should be getting mobile software. If you don't have mobile software, I think you're making a mistake because I don't know how you're going to beat me in the market. Let's manage our time here. It's, let's see, we're approaching, is that correct? We're approaching an hour and 45 minutes. Plumbing, oh man, we've got a long way to go. Let me blow through this, okay? If you have questions, I'm gonna to try to answer them. We're required to inspect all these things. Main water supply shutoff valve, it's that. There's water coming in, public water. There's the water meter, there's a check valve. There's a pressure regulator. regulator. Oh, and it's not copper. It's copper there, and then transitions. That's okay. What kind of pipe is it? Oh, I don't know. You take the plumbing course and you'll know how to identify that type of plumbing from 10 feet away. Main, for water, uh, main water shutoff valve and main fuel supply shutoff valve. There's the valve next to the heating system. There's the tank, buried oil tank, propane tank, right? Water heating equipment, including TPR valves. There's the gas water heater, propane water heater, right? That's labeled for propane. So is the heating system. There's the unit there. Don't touch that temperature. Don't ignite anything. Don't ignite a pilot. Don't turn anything on with the hot water tank. I had a home inspector buddy who turned on the pilot light, turned on the, the a regulator and left it. And that TPR valve discharge, it forgot to turn it back off. Should have turned it back off. Shouldn't have turned it back on in the first place. And that thing flooded the basement because it was defective. It was turned off for a reason. Don't turn things off. My hand is on the valve, but I'm not turning it on. There's a TPR extending to the floor. It is dry, it's bone dry, it's never leaked. I don't see any water marks at all. If I saw a water mark, I would have recommended a plumber to come and further evaluate because there never should be any water marks below a TPR valve. If it ever is and it's dry, that means something went wrong in the past and wasn't fixed. It could discharge at any time. And they just know when the homeowners are on vacation and they discharge. Expansion valve tank, um, it's like a balloon in there it's for potable water and, uh, and it um, absorbs pressure because um, when the hot water tank turns on, uh, cold water heats up and water expands when it warms up. And there's a check valve on the water supply. So when the water and the pipes expand, it can't go back and it can't expand. Where is it gonna expand? in the bladder tank. So when you have a check valve on the supply water coming in, the plumber will often put in an expansion tank. In fact, if it's missing, I'll recommend it. Check out that. Like this is a natural draft hot water tank. I don't see any scorch marks here. It should not be drafting properly. Look where it goes. It goes up the hill and then down the hill. So there should be a night, well, they went up because they like that like first 12, 16, 18 inches, right? Above the draft, depending on what year of code you are. Um, and, but it should never come back down. It can't come back down. So it's always sloped up. It's like um, drain waste vent pipes. Sewer pipes are always sloped down. <laughs> There's never a loop like that. So this is, a, this is a major defect. This is a material defect. This could be causing problems and it's, I don't see any scorch marks. I'm just surprised that this isn't all scorched and that there are, there isn't any like stuff, soot, 
Rust. So that's a defect, okay? Slope of a event pipe. Um, interior water supply, I'm supposed to inspect all that, uh, including all the fixtures by running uh, water at all the faucets and all the fixtures, all the toilets for proper flushing, by uh, proper operation by flushing. So I'll flush all the toilets twice, all the sinks, tubs, showers, functional drainage. Uh, we don't do um, a leak test on any of the showers or tubs. Some inspectors do. I don't have that kind of time. I'm not required to. I don't exceed the standards of practice in that way. Um, never find the value in that. Um, but I have uh, filled up tubs on new homes and Whirlpool tubs that are hardly ever used and they always leak. Uh, flush the toilet, run the sink, hot and cold water at the shower, and then go back and do it all again. Make sure there's hot and cold water at, the, at all the fixtures. And in this section, I include the exterior water faucets. And this is a frost-free hose bed because of the climate of the home. Required to inspect the drain waste vent system from the top of the roof all the way down into the basement. There's the pipes coming down, slope down to the main drain, and there's a clean out. Drain sump pumps with accessible floats. The float was not accessible. There's a check valve, it's plugged in. Can't get that cap off. Um, damp, signs of water, prior water levels. Um, and uh, I would have loved to lift that float. Um, according to the standards of practice, I'm required to inspect or uh, describe whether the water supply is private or public. There's a water meter with a, uh, a reader, so it's public. Location of the valve supply, right there. Um, location of the main fuel supply shutoff valve, well, that's there on the outside, and it's um, a fuel storage system, so there's a tank on the outside, and the capacity of the water heating system, and I take a picture of the label of the hot water tank. Report as in need of correction, deficiencies in the water supply by viewing functional flow in two fixtures operated simultaneously, and that's when I get to the bathrooms, which is around 10.15, by the way. Um, if it's an eight o'clock a.m. inspection. So I flush the toilet, run the sink, hit the shower, and do it all over again. Um, deficiencies in the installation of hot and cold water faucets. So, uh, you know, hot is on the left, cold is on the right. Um, there's a little dispute about which is right and left when you get inside a tub. Well, it's, it flips. So it's on the outside, hot and cold. But when you're on the inside and you need to turn off the hot water in an emergency because it's scalding hot, you want it to be on the left. You want to protect the occupant. So the occupant, the user of the tub, it's on the inside, so the hot should be on the left. Um, active plumbing water leaks that were observed during the inspection, I didn't see any. Um, toilets that were damaged, had loose connections, were on the floor um, loose, or you know, I used the side of my leg and I don't like to touch the toilet tanks and a lot of inspectors wear gloves. Um, so I didn't have any problems with the toilets. And you can group the bathrooms together in your inspection report because the standards of practice, they're at the absolute minimum that you're required to inspect, but you can add things to your report. In Texas, there's a state required report uh, outline. You're kind of stuck in there, although you can tweak it a little bit and customize it by adding to it. I grouped all my bathrooms together in my inspection report. And uh, I also did the laundry separate. I did the garage separate. I did the kitchen separate. I did the carport separate, separate and any other ancillary inspections, I did them separately. So you could group them like this, like this is the first floor half bath, toilet, sink, GFCI, fan, second floor bath, toilet, sinks, shower, shower. There's a little watermark here Nothing with the infrared, nothing with the moisture meter, but I do see some water stains on it. So I'm just gonna try to make it leak by closing the door and then pretending like I'm in there with my hand and try to get the water to deflect into that corner because sometimes it leaks, but I couldn't get it to leak. That's okay. And if it does leak, uh, it's not my fault. Um, in fact, if I break something or make something leak, uh, I flush the toilet and it leaks on the floor. If I turn on the dishwasher and it leaks on the floor, um, I should get a pat on the back. Uh, I'm supposed to, that's my job to break things. If the, if I hit the garage door opener by using normal operating controls and, uh, the garage door panels fall off the track. Good. First thing I'm going to do is take a picture of it. And too bad. I didn't get a video shot of it. 
and I'm gonna put it in a report as a defect that I found this. By using normal operating controls, it fell apart. By touching the um, soft brass, um, brass um, drain pipe, chrome coated, right? I love to crush them. Crush that and it fell right into my hand. First thing I do is take a picture of it. Right? If dishwasher leaks on the floor by just turning it on, if it, if it wasn't tagged or anything, I'm, I'm turning it on using normal, proper, more, normal operating controls and it falls, uh, just completely leaks on the floor. Uh, I'm taking a picture of my wet feet in the puddle in the kitchen. Yeah, and I'm not responsible for it. I'm responsible for finding the problem before my clients do, if I can. And that's what I did. So don't worry about making the shower door leak. If it leaked in the past and you can make a leak again, that just is good, valuable information for your client. There's no plumbing access panel behind that uh, shower. So I really like to see that. Second floor bathroom GSEI, fan, window, master toilet, master tub, master shower, and do it all over again with fixtures running all at the same time. See if there's functional flow coming out of the shower. You don't want low flow or poor flow. That's happened to me very infrequently. Master bath, GFCI, the door closes, electrical. You have to inspect the service drop. What's a service drop? Well, terminology related to electrical service components is available in InterNACHI's free online how to perform residential electrical inspections course. And there's this one section of the course that I really love and enjoy. It's a picture of components of the service, like the service entrance cable, the SEC, and the overhead conductors. And we break it down and we go component by component and identify what each one is. Not all homes will have this. Not all homes have overhead service, right? A drop, but some do. And when you come across things like this, you want to be able to speak like um, other professionals do. So the service entrance cable in this picture is the blue arrow. That goes to the meter in this, uh, in the, at this house. And it's a line of service conductors. Those are the white arrows pointing to those three black. Why are there three and not four? Um, located between terminals of the service equipment. Um, that's the main disconnect and a point usually outside the building, clear of the building walls where they're joined by a tap or a splice, that's the orange arrows, to the service drop or overhead service conductors and those are the red arrows. So the blue arrow is pointing to the SE, the service entrance cable. Those are the, that's the one thing that I can see on this home. I don't actually have an overhead but I wanna be able to use these terminologies correctly because when it, the standards of practice says I'm required to inspect the service drop, I better know what that is. And service drop are the red arrows. Those are the cables coming overhead from the telephone pole, likely. And those, uh, that's the service drop. And it has to be 10 feet above the sidewalks and final grade from the bottom of the drip loop. So the bottom of that drip loop, you can see it dripping, in the loop comes, hangs down, has to be 10 feet to the grade, at least, or 12 feet above yards or driveways. That's the overhead service drop, that's the overhead lines, and 18 above the street. Sometimes I've come across often, or I feel like I can almost reach the overhead lines, the service drop, that's, a material defect that could kill somebody. At this house though, I don't have that. I have an underground service. There's the electric meter. My hand is on the meter for context. Remember, my first time home buyers, they have no idea. This could be a refrigerator or what is that? Is it a grill, outside grill? So I put my hand there and they go, ah, oh, I know what that is. That's on the right side of the house. I'm required to inspect the overhead service conductors and attachment point. So the overhead conductors are the white arrows and red arrows. There's the overhead conductors and the attachment point is the, the, where they connect, the taps, the orange arrows, the tap or splice for the service drop should be below the weatherhead if it's, if it's installed. And I don't have any of that. This is what I have at this in a particular home inspection. I got a meter box here for the underground service. 
so I don't have any overhead service conductors. I'm required to inspect the service head, gooseneck, and drip loops. Well, there's no service cap or weather head component in this picture. Overhead service conductors must have a service weather head or cap or an approved gooseneck. And I don't have that on, at this house. The service mast, service conduit, and raceway. Well, there's no service mast at this inspection, but there's an underground conduit in this inspection picture, and there's a, a service entrance cable. There's the conduit there. Electric meter and base, that's pretty easy. Boom. Main service gets disconnect, that's at the main electrical panel. And the main service disconnect must be clearly marked. Main disconnect must be, be either inside or outside the house, and it's close to the service conductor where they enter the house. So where that SEC cable, where that cable comes in to the, it has to be pretty close to that. Can't be in a bathroom. And no more than six breakers can be used to disconnect everything. I'm required to inspect panel boards and overcurrent protection devices. That's just circuit breakers or old fuses. And there they are there. You're not required to remove the dead front cover from the electrical panel board. Required to inspect the service grounding and bonding. Ah, there is a difference between the two and what are they? Ah, ah, well, grounding, I'm looking on the outside for a grounding rod and an acorn clamp and a grounding wire. And the upper end of this electrode should be flush with the ground or just below the ground surface so that the end and the attachment are protected from damage. If you find a rod sticking up of the ground, like this one, it's a defect. Don't sugarcoat it. It should be at or just below the soil surface. In the inspection image here, I'm looking at the upper end of a driven rod at an angle and the attachment, and it's a defect. And how do I know that? Well, don't worry. In our How to Perform Residential Electrical Inspections course, we have a, a, um, a section on grounding systems. What is grounding? Grounding electrodes, driven rods, the diameter of rods, how long they are in the soil, corrosion, attachment, water pipes, jumper at the water meter, well casings, UFER grounds, UFER, ground plates, still framing, grounding rings, and it just goes on and on and on. So you can figure out, oh, and then the next section of that course is um, what is bonding. So don't worry about being able to inspect correctly a home related to the electrical systems components, including grounding and bonding. Uh, there's a bonding at the water meter at the public pipe, so that's good. Bonding is required where needed to ensure electrical continuity and the ability to carry a fault current to a path to grounding. The metal water pipe must be bonded to the service electric uh, equipment, service equipment enclosure. However, look, I've got water distribution pipe that's plastic and it's CPVC, chlorinated polyvinyl chloride, uh, ivory colored. This one has a little yellow stripe on it suitable for both hot and cold water. It's been used for a while, since 1960s or so. You can find it at your local Home Depot. Electrical bonding and grounding training for home inspectors is available through that same electrical course. And I'll take you to the section. There's a section on bonding and the purpose of bonding and where it should be and what it looks like and what a defect looks like. And what are those green screws? What are they supposed to do inside the electrical panel? Should I look for them? Uh, representative number of switches, electrical light fixtures, uh, receptacles, AFCIs. So there's light fixtures, receptacles, AFCIs are at the electrical panel right there, and GFCIs. So I'm required to inspect the GFCIs where they're located. And again, I think we talked about um, inspecting a home without any regard to the age of the house. So I, as a home inspector, would expect all the bathroom receptacles, like in this picture, to be GFCI protected. And I'm actually testing a GFCI with my finger right there in a bathroom. If I'm inspecting a brand new home, it better be in there. If I'm inspecting a 40-year-old home, 50-year-old home, or very old home, and it's not there, I'm gonna put it in my inspection report. 
Um, the presence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors, smoke alarms must be powered by the building wiring and have a battery backup. They should be interconnected so that when one alarm activates, all of them do, and they should be in each bedroom, outside each sleeping area, on each story, including the basement. And carbon monoxide detectors are required for houses that have a fuel-fired appliance, like this house, or an attached garage with an opening to the house, like this house, outside of each bedroom, inside of each bedroom with a fuel-burning appliance, and they're all interconnected. There's a fireplace there. Wow. But no, no masonry chimney, remember? And no big stack for a fireplace. Fake logs. Oh, it's a factory built fireplace. There's the chimney on the outside, right? Direct vent. The inspector shall describe the main service disconnects amperage rating, if labeled, and the type of wiring observed. So there's the main disconnect. And type of wiring observed? NMB. There's NM. And there's NMB, and there's knob and tube, and there's all kinds of wiring types. The most common type you'll find is NMB. You can go into Home Depot and look. Um, they're of different colors, right? White, yellow, orange, black, all this stuff. Great. Um, and you can take a look at the, the type of wiring, like the wire itself. Is it solid copper? Is it solid aluminum? Is it strand? Um, is it low voltage? And so, uh, to, and also, is it like 12, three, what does that mean? 14, three or something like that. So right here, I have type NMB, um, you know, um, higher temperature, almost 200 degrees Fahrenheit. NM is like older wiring, lower temperature, sometimes cloth sheathing. Inspector shall report in need of correction, deficiencies and in integrities of the service entrance can able, uh, conductors, insulation, drip loop, or vertical clearances or things. I don't have that. I don't have any, those kind of problems. Good. The inspection of the electrical meter on the outside was really literally less than a minute. Um, any unused breaker panel openings that was not filled? No, everything's good there. Um, test receptacles that were not GFCI protected or something wrong with the receptacles. I'm so far so good. Um, absence of carbon and smoke detectors. No, we have everything. It's pretty good. There's a section on the fireplace. So that includes this factory built fireplace. There's a, the cold air goes in and the, the exhaust gases come out on the, on the top. Um, and, you know, it's not masonry. So there's no foundation. It's actually floating uh, off of the ground, which is kind of fun to try to explain to a first time home buyer. Um, and there's the fireplace there. And there's the gas shutoff valve and an inspection restriction. Should I turn that valve on? Heck no. Should the real estate agent? No, oh, there's, really shouldn't. They could, but I'm going to actually take a video of them turning it on um, because when it explodes, mm, uh, and so that's an inspection restriction and uh, there's a normal operating control. It's on, but the gas valve is off. So we're not going to be able to, so I'm going to explain to my client that um, the home seller or home occupant or um, someone, a uh, listing agent or something like that, needs to explain uh, what is going on here. Maybe they turned it off for the winter, that's fine, um, but uh, they need to turn it back on. And this is a great opportunity for me to turn. While I'm here, why don't you think about hiring me for a walkthrough? So we we're doing a home inspection, but there's defects that we're finding, right? And I can follow up and make sure that before you sign on the line uh, to buy the home, that we look through the inspection report one more time. We'll go through the house and make sure everything was fixed prior to you moving in. And this should be running and we'll turn it off and we'll turn it on and make sure it works and, and you're happy with that before you close. So it's a great opportunity. Always be, you no, know, it's not your client's job to know what they need. That's your job. Your job is to make sure that you tell everyone, including your client, what fantastic, resources you provide, what value you provide, what services you provide, because they don't know. It's not for them to know what to order. It's for you to tell them. That's a marketing strategy, a business strategy. Um, Natcha.org slash SOP has the standards of practice for how to inspect the attic insulation and ventilation. So we do have an attic and we have 
ventilation, insulation, unfinished spaces. So I'm required to inspect the insulation in unfinished spaces, spaces including attics, crawl spaces, and foundation areas. There's the foundation area, and we already went through this, right? That's a gardening tool to help me inspect the insulation in unfinished areas, like the foundation area, and the space in the attic. So I'm inspecting the insulation. It's blown fiberglass insulation. Oh, anybody see what the defect is? There's a defect here. And I call it a defect. I call it a major defect. It's the bathroom exhaust fan blowing into the attic. And it's blowing into the soffit, I mean the, the soffit vent or the eaves area, it's right, right into the roof actually, roof sheathing. And according to modern code, I don't care when this house was built, according to modern code, all mechanical exhausts coming from the bath should exhaust to the outside. And that's, this isn't the outside, that's roof sheathing, right? So we should be blowing this outside. Um, Dryers need to be exhausting outside. If it's exhausting into the attic space, that's an unfinished space. That's not the outside. If you see a dryer exhausting into the attic space, because someone said that, well, there's outdoor air in the attic, um, that's a defect. That's a fire hazard as well. So that's a defect there. Love it. And the pipe is crushed anyways. Um, so I don't see any structural problems or problems with the insulation it was blown in, obviously can't get to any, uh, all the spaces. There is no flooring, so it's an inspection restriction. I was able to walk a little bit away from the attic access panel, which is right there in my picture. I took a, turned around and took a picture of where I came from. And I sometimes grab the insulation and let it fall if it's um, fiberglass and I'm wearing a mask and I always do. I don't touch anything like um, th things that uh, could potentially have hazardous materials inside it in older homes. Um, and the panel, access panel to the attic is not insulated. So that should be insulated and it actually should be sealed. Um, so I'm taking a look at ventilation and unfinished spaces as well. And we have that ridge vent, remember the ridge vent on top and the ridge vent from below and the soffit vents. Mechanical exhaust systems in the kitchen, bathrooms and laundry area, kitchen, it recirculates. Ideally it would go outside. I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. I'm gonna identify um, that it just recirculates. And, um, you know, I love exhausts that go outside according to code. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Okay. And there's a bathroom fan there that should be exhausting outside. And there's a window in that bathroom as well. That's one way to ventilate. And there's a laundry area. There's a laundry room and we have a major defect. It's a fire hazard. So there's louvers on the termination of the dryer exhaust, on the duct termination. And according to IRC M150215, chapter 1502.3, um, you can't have this, can't have a restriction. You need a hood, you need a big opening. You can't have any restrictions and that's the bathroom exhaust and that should be going outside as well. The inspector shall describe the type of insulation observed, fiberglass blown in, the approximate average depth of the insulation observed. You can measure it with your measuring tape or you can guess. Sometimes they'll have a tape uh, installed by the installer and it will be um, uh, like a white strip of paper with numbers on it to help you out. The inspector shall report as a need of correction the general absence of insulation or ventilation in unfinished spaces. We already described the access panel as missing insulation and now Right now it's about 10 o'clock or so, and I'm really happy with my time management because I've done all the heavy stuff and I've gotten out of the attic. I've taken off my mask um, and I'm coming down my attic ladder and my attic ladder uh, is on top of um, a picnic blanket to show that I'm protecting my client's flooring and grabbing anything that might fall from the attic and I'm gonna wrap it up and uh, shake it outside um, if it, uh, it's just fiberglass and not hazardous materials. Um, and then it's about 10 o'clock, two hours in, 
It's my three hour home inspection. And I'm writing the report as I inspect. So I know I'm gonna be done. I don't have to write the report like some of my friendly competitors are doing tonight. And I'm gonna to get to the interior. The interior takes me 10, 15 minutes. Doors, windows, floors, ceilings, switches, wall receptacles, representative number of everything. I can include, I include the bathrooms. So I'm gonna flush the toilets and run the sinks a couple times, look for water leaks and all that other stuff that we already went over actually. I'm required to inspect the number, representative number of doors and windows, not all of them. There could be a crack in a window. If I don't observe it and I don't inspect it, I'm not responsible for it, right? Yeah, it's both observed and deemed to be material. Representative number of doors and windows by opening and closing them, floors, walls, and ceilings, stairs, steps, landings, stairways, and ramps, rails, guards, and handrails, and the garage. The vehicle doors and the operation of the garage vehicle door openers by using normal operating controls. And there are inspection restrictions. I can't get to these windows. There's so much stuff in front of the windows. I can reach some of them. There's some there. There's a scratch here, that's a cosmetic issue. There's a scratch there, that's a cosmetic issue. And it looks like the front door, somebody had to kick it in because they forgot their key or something. So it's a safety issue, I'll put that in the report. And there's a garage uh, entry door. I said entry door, entry door. And there's the garage door. It's not manual, it's automatic. It has a garage door opener. It opens, it closes. And the inspector shall describe a garage door as manually operated or installed with an opener. So it's, it has an opener. There's a normal operating control. There's the button there. And it's plugged in, no extension cord, that's good. The inspector shall report as in need of correction, improper spacing between the balusters, spindles, steps, same thing as the exterior, photoelectric safety sensors that didn't operate, and any window that was obviously fogged or displayed other evidence of broken seals. So I'll wave my foot to break the sensor laser, and there's no problems with the handrails or the steps. And from the roof section, Inspector shall report as a need of correction any observed indications of active roof leaks. In the bathroom, this looked like a roof leak maybe to an inexperienced inspector, but it was actually just a, a scuff mark. So careful. And you may want to include the laundry in the interior section of your report or as a separate section. I do it as a separate section. So there's a laundry room there. It should be pressure tested hoses, not those cheap rubber hoses that often explode and when you're not home. And there's the dryer vent, a dryer, it's an electric dryer, it's not gas. And there's um, the plug. Oh, the catch pan underneath the clothes washer is damaged. So it's supposed, it's second floor bathroom, a uh, second floor laundry. It should be uh, catching water leaks underneath the clothes washer and draining out. And we got that major defect, that fire hazard at the duct termination, according to standard. I'm not a code inspector, but I'm gonna label that as a defect. And the kitchen, you may want to include that section in the interior part of your report or as a separate section. I do it as a separate section. Run hot and cold water at the sink, garbage disposal, look for leaks, use my hand and rub the underside of a valve. And if my hand comes out wet, that is an active leak. And there's the connection for the refriger um, refriger refrigerator ice maker probably, yeah, and water line because it's on the cold. And there's the GFCI protection for the kitchen counter receptacles. There's a missing plate, big deal, but I'll put it in the report because it's cracked. And all the receptacles are GFCI protected. I'll open and close the door. I'll look at this, the trays and the interior of the dishwasher um, and then close it and then turn on a short cycle. And then I'll test the stove elements and the oven elements and the microwave. And we've got a microwave leak detector from InterNACHI. Those are pretty cool. That's the shock and awe of testing a microwave. And there's some trim missing at the corner inside the kitchen. And this is the inspection report. We can go over the inspection report if you'd like. Let's see. Um, Richard asks, hi, from Whitson, Home inspections, 
just started my business and will be present, I'll, I'll be going to present myself to my first realtor Tuesday. Anyone have any pointers? Yes, go to natchi.org slash presentations. And there you'll find a ton of resources for home inspectors when you're giving presentations. My recommendation is to not talk about anything that I could say. Don't talk about anything that your competitor can say. Don't say, I'm professional, I'm thorough, I take pictures, uh, I send the report quickly, or something like that, right? Say something completely different. You have to be completely different, exceptionally different, and provide a credible value. So you have to practice your elevator speech. I wouldn't talk more than five minutes. I wouldn't have more than 10 slides. I would feed everybody. So my home inspection company back then was Peach Inspections, and we used to bring fresh baked peach pastries with uh, plates, forks, knives, napkins. And when I was talking for just a few minutes, blowing them away with my incredible value, like my infrared camera, and I pass around my infrared camera, take a look at that, and, oh, and while they're eating peaches and peach pastries, right? Today, I would uh, talk about the buyback program um, at natchiorg slash buy, or how I'm a one-stop shop. I'll do all of your inspections, anything you want, from septic to um, FHA inspections, 203K inspections. I can do it uh, all, because I'm certified like crazy, right? So that's what I would do, and do resources. So we have slides that you can customize. Like if you want to talk about AFCIs, we have a slideshow, it's about 10 slides, and you can customize it, you can stick your logo in there and talk for about 10 minutes. Say something that's really uh, valuable and concise and to the point and interesting, and then get the heck out. That's my recommendation. Um, let's see. Patrick Butler, if you don't have software that doesn't have video features included, can you always use YouTube videos to attach the, to your PDF inspection reports? Right. So. Um, that's more steps. So I like to have um, systems in place that make my life easy. To be successful, you have to have things in place. If you're, especially if you're starting off and you're doing everything on your own as an entrepreneur, sole proprietor, you know, you are the inspector, but you're also the business owner. You're also CFO, CEO, director of marketing, director of finance, you have to do the inspections, you have to do follow-ups, you know, the radon person, you know, it goes on and on. So you have to have systems in place. And while you're doing all that, you're answering the phone and scheduling jobs. So that one extra step is not worth it for me. I'd rather invest in a software that does it all. So I can manage my time and I'm more efficient. I can do things I can have systems in place so I can do other things that are more valuable to my clients so I can demand higher prices. There are old school ways of doing everything and those old dogs are not learning how to be efficient with their time. They do one or two jobs a week because their marketing is weak because they're stuck doing old ways of handling things. So you have to be efficient with your time. You have to be incredibly different because if you're just the same as everybody else, then what is the distinguishing characteristic between you and me if we're saying the same thing at the same real estate presentation and our websites say the same thing? You know what the difference is? Price. When all else is the same, the only deciding factor is price. And lowest price wins. And when we compete on price, everyone loses. So you owe it to yourself and everyone else to try to be completely different than me. Try to find a niche. Try to find that extra exceptional difference that makes you special. And it answers the question, why should I hire you instead of Big Ben Inspections? And if you can find that out, hmm, or if you can figure that out, then you work on your marketing. So what is a resource that you can use if you don't know what makes you different from all the rest? If you 
have really no idea why you should be hired in comparison to any other inspector. InterNACHI has a InterNACHI member marketing team. There's seven highly creative marketing professionals. They design, they illustrate, and they also consult. And one of the things that you can do is email Jessica at the marketing team and ask for the initial checklist of questions that helps their clients figure out what makes them different. What's your story? What's your brand? Why should I hire you instead of the next inspector who seems to be just doing the same thing? You know, you don't want to be in the world of a commodity. You know what a commodity is? Commodity is something that's interchangeable with anything else. You can swap this one out for the next one. It doesn't, there's really no difference. And you know, a home inspection, you better be careful not to be a commodity because we live in that kind of world. We're all performing a home inspection according to the same standards of practice. We all look at the roof, we all look at the electrical system, we all take pictures, we all write a report, we all say the same thing, we look at the same thing according to the same standards. So the only difference would be price, unless you can think of a reason to hire you. So the, the reasons why people hired me was, um, well, I'll take you there, let me show you. This is a good exercise. Go to Big Ben Inspections, bigbeninspections.com, bigbeninspections.com. Boom, you've hired, you found the best home inspector. Why? Well, you go up to my tab, why I'm the best. I performed thousands of home inspections. I'm a certified master inspector. I'm a certified professional inspector. I'm an instructor. I actually teach other in inspectors and I have a buyback guarantee. It's included. I use infrared on every inspection and all of these things, all these tabs on my website are reasons to hire me. Like my clients save more than $1,200 every year because I'm a certified home energy inspector and my energy report, which I write at the same time as my home inspection report with a click of a button, I can produce two reports, home inspection report and home energy report. And if you follow the recommendations in my home energy report, you can save money. $1,200 every year, $1,200? That's like a vacation, right? Hmm. Um, so you have to figure out what makes you special and different. For me, I authored a home maintenance book and here it is. So always give a home maintenance book to every client. Uh, here's my report. So nice big picture in the front, some identification of things. Here's a table of contents, some general information about who was there and when I was there. And the next page, page three is what really matters in an inspection. There's only four things that really matter in an inspection. And this is what I would actually present to real estate agents. I forgot who asked. What would I pre present on? I present on what really matters. And I would read this and get the heck out. Feed everybody and get the heck out. So read what really matters in a home inspection. It's a fantastic article. There's only four things. And most real estate agents would be like, oh, yeah, you're right. Try to get on the same page as a real estate agent. They're thinking about other things going and closing. You're thinking about reporting the condition of the home. And that article kind of like overlaps, kind of makes things uh, easy to understand why you're performing an inspection, the value of an inspection, what really matters in this inspection. So at the end of your three hour home inspection, you get a 50 page report. You just think about what really matters in an inspection. It's these four things. So let's focus on that. Let's not worry about the, the blemish, the cosmetic items, the loose little things, the cabinet knob is missing or something like that, right? Let's think about the important things, those four things. I'll let you read what they are. Here's my report. I try to shove as many pictures in the report as possible. There's pictures of the roof and it's roof because that's the first 
thing that I inspected, and it's the first thing in the standards of practice in this first section of my inspection report. It's actually a, uh, a section in the home maintenance book as well. And it's, um, and that experience that my clients have um, is consistent. There's a consistency, there's a flow in my entire inspection process and their experience with me. It all makes sense. They're reading the report. The first thing that they read was the first thing that we talked about when they arrived at the home inspection. It's the roof, right? Yada, yada, I talked about things that are interesting and maybe identified some stuff and described them some things, but the only things that are important are those four things that matters, what really matters in a home inspection, and it's red. So if there's something that matters, I put it in red and I put it in bold and I italicize it. Correction and further evaluation is recommended. Remember the value of a home inspector recommending further evaluation? The gas is off at the log unit. I don't know, if you turn it on, it could explode. I have no idea. I'm not turning it on. It's red though. That's a correction and further evaluation that's recommended. Everything else, here's some monitoring, right? There's a low spot in the ground near the surface of the, of the foundation that it could cause water problems. It's a monitoring. It wasn't wet or if there was a puddle, um, yeah. Uh, correction and further evaluation, missing handrail, so there's a lot of pictures and the only call to action items are in red. And this is the full report. So we can go here, correction and further value. The filter is being sucked into the blower fan. Um, it hasn't been serviced and cleaned in over a year. There's the plumbing section, the components. So when I think of uh, inspecting, I think of systems and then I think of components within that system. So the roof system, and then components would be the roof covering materials and anything that intersects the roof. Then I go to vents, the plumbing vents, and then just chimneys, and then the flashing, and then the actual condition of the roof, and then the, the gutters, and then downspouts, and then the exterior system, siding, windows, doors, steps, roofs. And that's how the, the standards of practice are organized. Roof, system, and then the components of the, like the electrical system and then all those components that we went through, right? And that's how I inspect, and that's how I report. And there's a consistency and a, a really nice experience that your clients have when everything just meshes together. And also helps reduce your liability. When you are consistent in your inspection process according to some kind of standard, then defects just jump out at you because you're doing every home inspection the same way. Then when a defect is like, when well, you have a TPR valve that's not extended to the floor or it's dripping on the floor, it's like, boom, oh, when you have a, when you have a, um, an opening in the dead front cover at the breaker, like, boom, it jumps out at you. That's a defect, right? When you have, steps leading up to a slider door and there's no handrail, oh, that's a defect. Because you're doing the same process. It's always the same, always the same, always the same. And that's part of your time management. And you're not blowing through the house. You're not skipping over things. You're not running through and not caring about being a competent, thorough, complete, comprehensive inspector. No, nope. you're just being efficient with your time. Like I was telling you, I can inspect that electrical meter in less than a minute. I can inspect the hot water tank in about a minute. Heating system, maybe five minutes. Foundation, uh, that's like 20 minutes. Uh, there is a lot to look at a foundation. Roof, 15 minutes. Exterior, another 10. You know, pool, uh, if you're doing the ancillary inspections, you know. Uh, oh, by the way, sewer scope inspections takes an extra 15 minutes. You can charge an extra 300, maybe 150. 300 by itself, 150 on top of a home inspection. How do you know all these things? Because if you're not paying attention to your time, you're not making money. Like a lot of inspectors will say, I grossed a half a million last year. Big deal. What was your profit? Right? There's just certain ways to think about your business. Yeah. I did an inspection today. Great. How long did it take? Six hours. Nobody wants a six hour home inspection. You're not making any money. Not doing any money, making any money, doing a six hour home inspection. 
right? Time is your most precious thing in business. You have to manage it well. It needs systems in place. You can shoot a video separately and then download it from your device or your computer and then upload it into YouTube and then share it with your client, right? One, two, three, four, five steps where you can just put a system in place that does it for you. Uh, because in business, we teach this in our business class. You know, you can calculate a profitable inspection fee. How do you know you're making money? How do you know that your inspection fee is making you money? How much profit is in your inspection fee? When the phone rings and it's someone who wants to schedule a job, do you know that you're going to make money on it? It's all about math. It's not about guessing. And in business, in very general terms, in the home inspection business, you wanna, you wanna think about it as a fraction number divided by something else. And on the top of the fraction, the numerator is your money. And you want that as big as possible. You want to grow, you want a grossly large amount of money, gross revenue on the top, divided by what? Time. And if you have a very big top, a lot of money divided by a little bit of time, you're making a lot of money. If you're lopsided and you're making a little bit of money and it takes you all day to make that money, then you're not going to be successful. What you wanna do is increase your gross revenue. There are methods and ways, business resources through InterNACHI where you can gross, increase your gross revenue and you can reduce the amount of time. One of the best ways to reduce your amount of time is to become knowledgeable by taking classes from a home inspector college, not another college, not another school that charges you a lot of money and they're not accredited and not accountable for anything. And they don't have any upgraded or revised curriculum and no textbooks, 20 year old textbooks. Great. Nope. So you want to know as much as possible. You want to know more than you actually need to know. Why? To be a smart head? No. To reduce your time. Because in, in this fraction, right, you want to increase gross revenue. How do you increase gross revenue? Oh, uh, we can help you reduce your time. We can also help you increase your gross revenue um, by training you in other ancillary services. So you can bundle services together and make more money. So you're not just doing a home inspection service, you're doing three or four other services all at the same time without adding a lot of time because you, you want to keep that denominator, the bottom part of your fraction, as small as possible. So we provide you with resources, processes, systems in place to reduce your time, to manage your time, and marketing and business resources to increase your gross revenue. You want a ton of money divided by a little bit of time. You want to squeeze that time. Uh, here's the structural part, the basement. Looks good. I love my inspection report. Not too many words, very concise. Things like this, like floor joists are made of dimensional lumber two by tens. Good, right? Um, there's a sump pump. There's the attic, right? No signs of active water penetration visible today. Um, improvements recommended, insulation on the attic access panel. Bathrooms, the sink drain was slow and shower doesn't have a, a panel, access panel. Everything else looked good. Carbon monoxide detectors, there's some things there in the kitchen, missing plate cover, the kitchen worked. Correction and further evaluation, um, Ask the seller about all these cables. My client was freaking out about the cables. I just couldn't uh, distract them from that. They didn't understand cables and phone cables and things like that. And it looked like there was extra ones. There were, but my client wanted to know about that. I didn't have to put it in the report, but I put it in the report for my client. A eh, big deal. Um, standards of practice. And then there's illustrations. 
you stick illustrations in there, pictures, videos, illustrations, and these illustrations, um, high definition illustrations come from InterNACHI's gallery. We, um, we can take a look at that. That's at nachi.org slash gallery. Natch, just real quick, nachi.org slash gallery. Natch, that spice up your report and helps you explain things. So nachi.org slash gallery, thousands of images of every system and component of a house. So if you want to talk about framing or something like that, um, you can talk about heating. There's heating systems. Um, there's the, uh, what should we talk about? Um, a buried oil storage tank. What's it look like? It looks like that, right? So use illustrations to spice up your inspection report. And these illustrations are free through International's Gallery for every member. And we have them in Spanish as well, if you wanted to put agua instead of water. Um, the report conclusion and walkthrough is where we are very clear about um, what we have done. We can't see behind walls, right? Therefore, you should not regard this inspection as a guarantee or warranty. As a homeowner, you should expect problems to occur. Roofs will leak. Basements may have water problems and systems may fail without warning. We cannot predict future events. For these reasons, you should keep comprehensive insurance policy. <laughs> Whenever I inspect a roof, not, we can go to the roof section again, but um, I say, like, I'm not guaranteeing that this roof won't leak. It may be leaking right now. It's just not raining. Um, and then there's a section for pre-closing walkthroughs about describing finding defects now and making sure that they were corrected or attended to before closing. Um, that's another way of providing um, increasing revenue. Now, there's only a few ways you can make money in the home inspection business. And one of the best ways is to make sure you're keeping in contact with your clients, providing them consistent, valuable information, and increasing the number of times that they use you. So if you can double the amount of inspections per client, you've just doubled a lot of money. Uh, and there's a, a letter for your clients. Um, sorry, for the homeowner, the seller, they want to know that, um, well, I told them that um, all the inspectors wore shoes that were indoor only shoes. So if you see any marks on the carpet, it wasn't us, it wasn't the inspector. We, door, we wore indoor only shoes. We check over 500 different things and we may have moved something like um, the blinds or something could be askew. We apologize. We want you to check these things. And um, here's our contact information if you're moving into the same neighborhood. So that was the inspection and the inspection report. And let me see some questions here. While you take a look at the URL, if you wanted to know where to get everything, and that's at nachi.org slash everything, and visit our online courses, accredited home inspector college at internachi.edu. Has your inspections changed drastically because of COVID? I talked to inspectors all over the country. There's not much change going on. Sometimes um, there's a recommendation for no one to be there. And if there's someone there to stay away and the inspectors are wearing face masks. But um, the real estate agents are a little bit difficult to talk to. So you just simply invite them to an online coffee meeting. And a lot of inspectors are doing that. They're cold calling inspectors, uh, real estate agents and inviting them to a, a virtual coffee. Um, Let's see. Uh, so Gregory says, I use Spectora soft, software, perhaps a little more spendy, spendy, a little more expensive, but worth it for him. So I would agree with that. Um, <clears throat> so the, the best thing that helped our company uh, become special and different from all the rest was to invest and an infrared camera. My first infrared camera a long time ago was five grand and I put it on the credit card. And uh, I was like, mm, what am I gonna do now? So we raised our prices. Why? Because we added value, incredible value, overwhelming value 
my clients perceived this to be incredibly value, valuable. This is valuable information. This, this made us the best inspector. This made, made us better inspectors. And when you're different and providing incredible, overwhelming value, then you can demand higher prices. And when you demand higher prices, you got more money to play with, which means that every client of mine, after I purchased my infrared camera for $5,000, was actually just paying for the infrared camera. So we don't like overhead. We don't like to add overhead to our business. We don't, we don't have, where's the home maintenance book? The home maintenance book, right? Is $2.70 per client. You give away three, right? One for the occupant or home seller, right? One for the agent and one for your client. Three home maintenance books. It's a lot of money. You know, it's like almost 10 bucks. So you raise your fee, raise your fee 10 bucks. So you don't have overhead. You don't increase your overhead. You allow your clients to pay for your infrared camera. You allow your clients to pay for their own home maintenance book, right? So don't increase your overhead. Increase the value you provide. Increase your brand to be so special and overwhelming that you're going to make their lives so much better that they are going to give you their hard earned money. And you have a reason to demand higher prices because you're special, different, and incredibly valuable. Yeah. Um, mm, I'm looking, I'm looking a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, I don't see guys. Um, I'm looking at Mike's. Oh, Warren, negative dream, went to the purchase property in the past, flooded. Yeah. Uh, just mean it to turn cracking. Maybe I'm looking at the questions as fast as I possibly can. We're responsible for a solution to a defect such as, are we responsible to state a solution to a defect such as epoxy in the basement wall that you discussed? Aren't we liable for, heck yeah. Yeah, don't, don't feel like you have to diagnose the problems. All you have to do is report upon the conditions, uh, upon the indications of a problem that you both observe and deem to be material. You do not have to tell anybody in written format how to fix the things that you found wrong, right? So Gary, no, you are required to inspect and report upon the defects, the material defects that you've both observed and deemed to be material. Uh, would you consider, you don't have to say like, oh, this is how I would fix this. Yep, don't do that. Let the, let your recommendation for a professional to further evaluate and correct, handle that. Um, would you consider that crack a minor or major defect? Uh, it was a major defect in my report, which included, uh, which really was just uh, the recommendation for the epoxy by a professional. Because I knew that that's what um, was needed, right? So I made that specific recommendation, but I left it up to the professional. There's water coming through, and there's a crack in the foundation. And it can be fixed by epoxy. It's just obvious. Yep. Um, and it was a major defect because when my clients move in and the basement is completely empty, I bet there's a couple other cracks that are leaking or have water marks coming from them, and. Uh, I would definitely get a phone call of that. So um, I'm not going to make it a minor problem. A minor problem is something like uh, uh, changing a light bulb, changing the air filter, <laughs> maybe changing the thermostat, maybe, I don't know, upgrading a thermostat, um, minor problems. You know, there's a scratch in the cabinet or door or something like that. Major is you need a professional to further evaluate and correct. Mike says he has 350 to 400 photos per report. That is amazing. Shouldn't a condensate line discharge into waste plumbing? Not necessarily. Um, only in some areas. Some areas you're not allowed. Some areas you're allowed. Uh, ideally, it would just discharge outside. Uh, or it can be, if, if you think it's going to freeze, it can go into the sump pump, but you have to watch. You can't just shove stuff into uh, 
the drain line, right? I love, I had a sump pump once discharge the tube and they drilled a half inch hole into the sewer line on the side of it and just stuck it in there, right? So you can't do that either. So it's like a yes or no. Uh, Randy says, Ben, I like your videos. Off. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, do you measure the house's dimensions to figure out the appropriate amount of ventilation needed? Nope. You just estimate the ventilation. Yep. It's all estimates, all general things. We don't measure anything. I don't even, you know, I don't, you don't have to quantify. Like when you're using the infrared camera and you take our infrared training courses, there's a huge difference between qualification and quantification. Quantification is measuring things. We don't want to quantify anything as a home inspector. Um, we don't count or measure. We don't care what the, what the uh, moisture content reading actually is on our measuring device, um, metering device, moisture meter. Um, we're looking for abnormal, uh, abnormalities, anomalies, odd things, things that are short, tall, too much, too big, something like that, a big crack, something like that. We're not actually measuring anything, especially when it comes to infrared. It's all qualitative. There's a difference between that. Um, that looks like really good. Uh, there are a few other questions. They're kind of repeating. A lot of people are just saying, yep, oh, uh, Ryan asked, do you handle a 40 foot aluminum ladder on your own? I do. Uh, it is almost impossible. Almost impossible. It's really scary too. Because when that thing goes up, uh, boy, it's just, it's way up there. But I, whenever I needed it, I needed it. And it, it was really just, I think it was a lot of uh, just show too. I mean, I used it in a dozen years. I was a home inspector. I probably used it four times. I can remember each time. Um, so, you know, I, I liked driving around with it. It was part of my brand. I had a big truck. I have a big van, huge. The biggest, first it was the biggest truck and then the biggest van that I could afford with big ladder racks. And that's how I approached um, our business. We wanted the tools that just overwhelmed any of our competitors. When you look at our trucks, our vehicles, they were just overwhelmingly beautiful. Just, oh wow, look at all those ladders. And you know, my partner was a, a roofer. So they were, we were really comfortable in getting on roofs and using ladders. Uh, a lot of software questions. I think I answered a lot of the software questions. Um, so I'm going to, I think what I'm going to do is end it because we're on hour three. So if you are um, going to um, enter your CE credit hours as an Internet Chain member, it's not one, it's not two hours, it's now three. So we've been at this at three hours. I really love the idea of having a three hour free live online home inspection training class. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, it's been an honor to teach you tonight. If you have any questions, we're all on the contact page. My email is ben at internachi.org. Your education team is education at internachi.org. And uh, the marketing team is on our contact page and the member services team is on our contact page. You can contact us at any time for any questions. I'm gonna go through your questions. I'm gonna export them and go through them and see if I can reply to um, you individually with uh, you know, the really good questions that we haven't gotten to yet in this class. But that was a lot of fun. That was, I had a ball, I had a blast. So I hope you learned a lot. Please feel free to um, register for the next webinar. And that's at natchi.org slash webinar, natchi.org slash webinar. And that's where we all are. So I wanna say goodbye to you all. Uh, thanks for a great evening. I love hanging out with home inspectors and talking home inspection stuff. Hope you learned a lot. I know I did. I'll see you next time. I'm Ben Gramico from Internachi. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And this is a free online home inspection training class. I'll see you next time. Stay safe. Bye.